Welcome back. Uh, we, as you join us, we're just hooking up with uh, Thomas Mush here, uh, the uh, lead car in GT1. It's the last remaining Ford GT out there, I'm afraid. And um, uh, we're just hearing a uh, suspected broken leg. Uh, for who is that, Johnny Mullen? That was for the cameraman that got uh, hit earlier on. Ah, uh, yes, uh, I think that's Andrew dis Marriott, dislocated actually. Dislocated sh shoulder, broken collarbone and nose, and apparently the camera's broken too. Well, there so. you are. That, that's Andrew Marriott, e ever conscious of, uh, <laughs> of exactly where the money's being spent. Uh, clearly, he's got some medical bills uh, to find fairly shortly, I have to tell you. Um, it's uh, yeah, that was a, a really nasty incident. Cameraman just got in the way. He was wearing a bib. He was in the right place at the wrong time. Uh, I think that's uh, how we could possibly describe yeah. it. Very unfortunate. And uh, I've just been down actually in the Highcroft pits, having a look at some stuff. And uh, uh, we're just finally dropping down. And listening from there, the car's running great. And um, yeah, we lost. But it happened that we lost in both safety cars, especially in the first one. We lost the one third of the lap. And uh, in the last one, we also lost quite a bit. So I don't know. That was not so lucky. But apart from that, it's running really good. And I think we're doing good, good job so far. What do you make of the lap times, the lap times of the Peugeot and the Audi? I mean, at uh, the start of the race, I mean, I started and I think at the start of the race we could keep up quite okay, but until that safety car issue was and then, uh, I mean, the Peugeots were apart from us, so and then it was, uh, yeah, difficult, I think, but would have been much closer, I think, if that safety car thing would have, would have had not happened. Um, but I mean, it's still a long way to go. We see they had problems and we, we keep on fighting with our Audi R15 TDI and we will strike back. What kind of stints do you do? Double, triple, quadruple? And how many sets of tires do you need? Uh, so far, uh, Rocky is right now doing a quadruple stint with one set of tires. Roma did the same before. I started with a triple stint on tires, uh, just to be sure. And um, yeah, right now we'll go back out and then we will decide either a triple or a quadruple. I, we will see on the tires, but for sure the four stints normally are no problem. They just did it before. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that, basically listening to Timo Bernard there talking about it, obviously he triple stinted the tyres and then from there on in their uh, quadruple, easy for me to say, stinted <laughs> the tyres. And uh, so exactly what we were speaking about earlier on uh, there, Carlton, in terms of them knowing as we watch Alan McNish there in the pits coming in for his pit stop, which will drop him back behind uh, the number nine Audi. And uh, hopefully we'll see if he can uh, come out close to the uh, number 007 Lola, Lola uh, Aston Martin and see if he can get out there and start taking their, their place back and get up into fifth well, running. The Shows, equal on pit stops. Sorry, uh, the yeah. Peugeots were indeed uh, just doubling. I think they're going to step up to trebling uh, if Audi start quadrupling. They're going to kind of follow each other out there. Uh, by the way, just to be absolutely clear, uh, Andrew Marriott was the gentleman that sent us the text, uh, well known to a lot of motorsport fans. He sent us the text about the injured cameraman. It's not actually Andrew Marriott, uh, just in case uh, anyone was worried or misunderstood. Well, uh, yeah, last time uh, I checked, Andrew wasn't a cameraman. Yeah, no, so, no, no. But uh, just uh, in Andrew's case, to be absolutely certain, Andrew's everyone realises it's not Andrew. He's alive and well doing, uh, doing yes. the uh, dot com at the moment. And uh, alive but slightly knocked about, sadly, is uh, the cameraman who got uh, knocked over by, I think it was the, the seven Num Number nine Audi. Uh, now nine Audi, I beg yes. not the seven. Uh, losing a wing mirror in the process and uh, he losing, uh, well, some uh, some solid pounds by the looks of it. Johnny, you t mentioned you've been down in the Highcroft bit. Obviously, this fight has been going on the whole race so far yes. between them and Stracker. Now, Johnny Kane's just ahead at the moment. What, what's the feeling at, at Highcroft? Do they think they can beat them eventually? I think they do. I think they, they realise that every time, and I mean, I mean no disrespect in this, but obviously it's, it's how strong is your weakest link. And I think that they, they feel that they have a stronger, weaker link than perhaps than the Stracker car. And uh, ultimately, I think uh, they know that Johnny and uh, Danny in particular are having to push extremely hard. Nick, to be fair, did a very, very good job there to uh, keep it absolutely clean and, uh, and not make any mistakes. But obviously the lap time still suffered a little bit. My goodness. Look at this on board, absolutely fantastic. Into traffic here, TDI up in front. Uh, we've got Jean Lazy though, that's just uh, going to uh, spare us a few words. Jean Lazy, you are fourth in the category, uh, well, you're fourth in the category here, it's going well. Well, it's all going very well indeed, he says. Well, uh, for, for me, it feels like the uh, first time here, um, despite that he's been here a long, long time ago. It's all new and exciting. So what's the uh, what's the strategy that's going on now? Uh, you were the second driver in the car. 
je vais repartir pour euh, deux fois euh, faire un double relais. Yep, I've been double stinting out there, and uh, uh, maybe a, a little bit more a bit later. A uh, very, very short and to the point. Jean Alesi clearly in very, very business-minded mode here. It's the 11 car, sadly. Uh, we saw them working on this uh, earlier on, and it's going to the garage. Uh, we're not overly sure what this. What was their problem earlier on, Johnny? Well, I, I bumped into Tom Moore, actually, as I was downstairs uh, uh, earlier on, and uh, he said that initially Johnny Cocker had had a, a very bad vibration. And, uh, and they found out that the rear floor was actually dragging wow. on, on the, the, the floor of the car, actually dragging on the track. And so they fixed that and got back out there again. And then they, uh, Emanuele Piro, as we commented on, actual fact, was doing some sterling uh, lap times, getting it back up into the order, as I, I remember Liz commenting about. And then uh, after that, I believe that uh, Paul Drayson got back in and, uh, and then he started smelling uh, a, an oil problem or something. And apparently the intercooler had gone onto the exhaust and was, was burning the, the oil in the car. So they had to fix that as well. Well, after they put that on the dolly jacks, um, personally speaking, it looked very, very flexible. Uh, yeah. it, I think it's the only way I can, it, I can put it that. I don't know whether the they, floor's gone again. Yeah, could I don't well know whether they'd actually like that, loosened yeah. any bodywork uh, before they'd actually decided to take it in. And this is a bad sight as well for the 12 car. Uh, they had uh, underbody damage after uh, shorting a couple of chicanes. The 13 car did exactly the same. I'm really not quite sure what the issue is. I was wondering whether it was actually a steering problem with them. And look at this, Marco. Yeah, that's Marco Andretti on board, of course. That car's now dropped to 21st. What a shame. Marco came here hoping he could at least win the petrol division. Obviously, no chance of beating the diesels and grandfather Mario is here cheering him on and uh, well it's just not going his way at all is it it's another of these baptisms of fire at the moment there's I mean, no great pace about this there's no sense of urgency either and that just kind of tells you what their night's been exactly. like and just where they are I can tell you I feel for them because I had the same problem two years ago here and it, at that point you don't wish the car would stop exactly but a little part of you thinks crikey how long how much further of this do you have to do when you know you're tooling around in 21st place and we ultimately made made our way back up to 11th in fact so it wasn't the end of the world but you kind of know that any chance of a podium because you dream you dream of winning obviously but you know you can't in those situations but you dream of a podium and getting lucky and as soon as you know that's gone for good it kind of takes a little bit of that motivation now johnny just two weeks ago you were calling the indy 500 and we saw marco finish fourth on the track then alex lloyd who was third got pushed back because of passing is marco going to make it one of these days is he is he going to be very very good um, I think he already is very, very good. I think perhaps he was brought in a little bit too quickly, too, too much too soon. But uh, I, I do think that he's, uh, he's going to be a, a very, very experienced driver once he gets himself going. And I think the Indy 500, whether he'll win it or not, he nearly won it his first ever time, remember, um, and, and was very unlucky not to. But I, I think he's, he's come into the LMS a few times in sports cars, done very, very well. He's very fast, but he's, people forget how young he is. I mean, he came up so quickly through the ranks. So I think he maybe needs to mature a little bit in a few areas. But just looking at, uh, you saw that picture in picture, it was uh, Gimme Bruni who will be waiting to get back into that car. I don't think they've sent him that high towards the ceiling. Uh, on very, very high jacks there, they're, uh, they're doing all kinds of work on the 82 car. At least I hope he's out of it having a cup of tea. Well, the gearbox went on that car, didn't yeah. it? So um, they're obviously going to have to, no longer can you change complete gearboxes, you have to change all the internals. So. Again, that's another situation where you kind of know that you're in you're, you're in a situation where you could have won your class, but you know that you're not going to now, and it kind of demoralizes the whole team and the drivers, but Reese are a fantastic team, and they won't give up. So the 12 cars just come in, and uh, we have uh, an Andretti waiting for us, Andretti the younger. Uh, unfortunately, he's probably feeling a good deal older tonight, especially with uh, 15 hours and 36 minutes plus remaining of this race. As John Mullen was quite, quite rightly pointing out, um, it's a bit of a heart breaker when uh, at this stage with so much of the night and then the next day still to race that's what it's all about after all uh, you're stuck down there in 21st position well he's obviously been uh, 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 just dragged away momentarily with the with the promise of uh, a coffee and a bun uh, so uh, as we look at the uh, Hankook up on its uh, jacks we were a little bit worried about the uh, the contact with uh, the road surface but Hankook have uh, proved on occasion that it can be uh, can be their track especially it's seems um, when it comes to intermediates they'll probably be hoping for a little bit of rain so they can start to shine yeah and remember this is the car Carlton that finished second in the Nürburgring 24 hours wow. two weeks ago first time Ferrari have ever contested it with a F430 430 they finished second how good is that and that is really where Hankook's strength is they can produce these tires for the Nürburgring for the Nordschleife in all conditions Le Mans have done all for them 
Well, we'll see how they go. Uh, they're, uh, they're busy with their change. This uh, overhead shot, I've only seen it at the Highcroft. I think we might also have it in uh, the Rebel team as well. Uh, but uh, just uh, the Rebellion boy. Oh, dear. Um, is that... Uh, Which car's that? That's not old news, is it? That's new. Oh, dear. And uh, it's not that far either. He's dragged a little bit. Uh, look at this. He's going to have to be careful on uh, getting out of here. It's a 28 machine. And, There's uh, Mark Rustan. That yeah. That's the Radical, isn't it? It is the Radical. Uh, the orange-coloured uh, Radical. A bit of a tangerine there. Oh, oh and he, has he overduced it? Just sent it back. He's all right. He's retrieved it. And, and you can that was, see uh, there, that was quite neat. Yeah, you can see there, though, when the lights pick it up offline, how much dirt and debris and yep. gravel there is as soon as you get offline so you can understand why when people get a little bit wide away from the racing line it's very easily done to just drop it and, and spin off now, remember this was the 56th car this year this car was admitted very late when the ACO built a 56 pit and thought, well, let one more car in. Surprise, surprise, it's a French car. Pierre Bruno, Mark Rostan, Mark Rostan, of course, a Le Mans regular and French GT champion some years ago. Um, they made room for them and uh, they're still running. Yeah, and he got it going again and nearly wiped somebody else out in the process he going did. through the Dunlop <laughs> Curve curves. Yes, I, I, I think it was one of uh, uh, one of the previous generation of Audis that uh, almost got a clip one there. One of the Curtis cars. I yeah. mean, you mentioned earlier on there about uh, the David Brabham and that shot above. It was a really sexy shot, it's isn't lovely, it? Isn't it? <laughs> and you can actually look down and you can yeah. see Brabs taking on board some fluid yeah. and then... Uh, and then getting back out there. Now, while he's making that stop, that's his 10th stop. He came, he came in, he was 82 seconds behind Johnny Kane. So it'll be interesting to see what the gap is when Johnny makes his 10th stop. And uh, we, get, we get the true picture of that lead battle for P2. Well, we finally do have an interview for you. It's Marco Werner. Marco Werner, it's a nice battle in the LMP2 category in between the two sister cars, more or less. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes close. Uh, in a moment, we are second. Uh, I had the lead in my stint at the end. It was quite good. I was happy. In the beginning, the car was quite uh, okay, sometimes a little bit struggling with the rear, but, but came better and better. I'm come closer with the car. I'm very close to say that's my baby now. The times were quite good. So looking forward for the next stint. Is it still difficult because you used to be the quickest car here in Le Mans and now you're in the LMP2 category? Yeah, it's a huge difference. I mean, um, much throw on the straights, uh, but late on braking and then the corner speed is there as well in Porsche corners. It's very nice to drive. It's still a challenge for me. I'm learning lap by lap. And uh, how is your program now for the rest of the night? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think so that everybody is doing triple stints. Uh, so then Marino is on the car after perhaps and uh, then I will do a triple stint and we will see what is going on with the tires. Maybe we can fall. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, nice to hear from him, actually. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it seems like he's been around for an awful long time. He's only 44. He's a youngster. Yeah, interestingly, Audi have got four of their top drivers here who are no longer driving before. That's one of them, Marco Werner, a Le Mans winner. Manuel Ipiro in the uh, racing car, a Le Mans winner. Frank Bieler meeting and greeting guests of, of Audi, a Le Mans winner. And also Lucas Lure meeting and greeting guests. I mean... And what no happens, Johnny? What happens uh, to your career? And, well, and no coincidence that Emanuele Pirro and uh, Marco Werner both shone, albeit not in Audis this year, but both shone in their stints in their respective cars. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, especially a circuit like Le Mans, you don't, you, you need a little bit of luck to win it, or a lot of luck to win it, but you don't win it multiple times like Marco Werner and Emanuele Pirro have done without also having a considerable amount of talent. Pescarello 24, a racing machine, is, uh, is back out. Richard Hine there, they uh, had a brief hiatus, as you saw. I and think that's uh, Timo Bernard getting back into yes. the uh, number nine Audi there as uh, Rocky gets out. And uh, I, I always love watching the prototype pit stops there. There is a real, it looks like they're rushing it, but they've practiced this again and again and again, and they know that they're going to be getting, as they go up on jacks, if Timo knows he's just tightening his shoulder straps as they're going up on jacks to put the tyres on, he knows he's got plenty of time in order to get himself queued to go straight out onto the track as soon as they drop him off the jacks. And where the old passenger seat used to be uh, before <laughs> they started putting it back and then took it out altogether. There's a handy little standing area as well so that uh, the exiting driver can just lean over and uh, just help strap up the, the uh, driver that's taking over from him. We're going to take ourselves a uh, brief commercial break and then we'll be back. But don't forget, eurosports.co.uk. Click on the message boards and then scroll down to uh, motorsports. Uh, if you click on Le Mans, then you'll find our uh, topic area, our thread. It's new, exclamation mark, 
Eurosport 2010, Le Mans Live. And we'll have a chat with you after this. Welcome back. Uh, it's uh, fuel up time uh, down at uh, Ferrari. I love the look of this car. Of, uh, I, I have to admit, it's uh, well, even in green. Yeah, something about it. It looks yellow actually on our screen. It here. does actually. I'm not <laughs> quite sure uh, the white balance has been done properly, but it's actually um, a sort of a viper green. Yeah. Um, I think is the way you could possibly describe it, uh, like a pea green, which apparently, officially, according to artists, is yellow. Oh. Anyway, but then, of course, at the moment, this is Jeff Hazel's only car that's still uh, running it properly at the moment. Well, it is Jeff Hazel. He and Beaky Sin shared the two cars, but Rizzi, all their hopes rest on this car at the moment because, as we just saw while we're yeah. in the break, the 82 car is still in the garage, still having that gearbox. Yeah, stuff. they're out of the fight. I mean, and it happened. It happened in 2007 when I was driving for Risi. We were leading by three laps in the uh, 82 car. It was then with myself and Jamie Mello and Mika Salo, and we had a problem. And uh, went uh, Jamie unfortunately hit some uh, oil and went off, and we didn't finish the race. And lo and behold, this car came through and finished on the podium. And uh, so they're, they're there or thereabouts. It's amazing. You'd say at the start of the race they haven't got snowballs if they're finishing on the podium, and then quite often at the end they're in the top three or four. Well, they get uh, away, and uh, just looking at uh, the Corvette, the 72 car, which is uh, just uh, birthed there for a wee while. Um, it's uh, a mixed challenge from Corvette, uh, just straddling GT1s and the GT2 class. And uh, there it is, the 72 car. It's the lead car, as far as they're concerned, as it should be, from uh, from that class. But uh, 72, at the moment, is running in second place behind the Ford of uh, Mr. Bush, who's uh, having a great time in 21st place, but the class leader as well. This, and this is by magic, the 73 car comes yeah. in as well. That's good marshalling. Very good indeed, yeah. But Stefan Gregoire just going out in the car. He shares the Jerome Pollockand and David Hart. David Hart's done a good job tonight. Of course, uh, this morning, seems like weeks ago this morning David was actually leading the Group C race in his uh, from a Porsche but uh, unfortunately he was involved in a couple of collisions had two burst tires and didn't finish that race but here he is in the main race doing a good job the 73 car being refueled at the moment Patrice Gozlard who's been with his team forever Julian Juice and Xavier Masson the Dutch driver do they still use it? I just didn't quite catch sight of uh, the refueling nozzle. It kind of goes in the side of the car and goes very, very deep in. It's much longer profile than a lot of the other uh, refueling pipes. Well, the reason for that dates back to Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s accident at Sears Point a number of years ago when he went into a concrete wall on an outlap. He actually did it in the warm-up right in front of me and uh, had it full of fuel because it was a warm-up and it actually knocked the neck of the of the tank off and actually basically went up like you know a shuttle it was unbelievably scary to watch and he actually got back quite badly burnt and ever since then they've changed their refueling system and that's one of the reasons why it goes so deep into the car to protect it from any possible impact it also does keep the weight very central and uh, their uh, their cell yes. is uh, is kind of very very wisely placed yeah i mean weight distribution is key in any race car and you're exactly right carson to point that out in terms of where they're going to have it when it's full of full of fuel and that was a driver change xavier masson taking the car over there so uh, on they go that car now it fourth in class so we've got uh, thomas much leading gt1 from stefan gregoire's corvette from julian canal celine that car we haven't seen a lot of but it's there in third on the podium at the moment and xavier masson for the corvette alfand in fourth in fifth place peter cox on board the young driver's aston that's the car that should should have been leading it was on pole yeah well uh, gimme rooney is, is finally going to be allowed to get into the car he's uh, being strapped in as we speak and uh, clearly they have finished whatever works they had started uh, but unfortunately for them they have gone to, from one to about ten in class which is a real real shame uh, 40th on track as we speak lights all ablaze and flaring here just about anything you look at even a pen light would uh, would be uh, dazzling here it's uh, nighttime good and proper at Le Mans and you're live throughout the night and of course uh, right the way until the finish tomorrow afternoon and that comes in around about 15 minutes and 24 uh, 15 hours and 24 goodness me even I was gonna say I was getting quite excited then I thought, I'm feeling really bright and breezy yeah. only 15 minutes left now I don't know whether this is an art shot uh, because we've had those before uh, I think you're looking at the driver in the background uh, looking <laughs> looking uh, a little pensive. Broody, that's, that's the word, isn't mm. it? I think so. Uh, same thing with the uh, McDonald's back wing. 
almost makes you hungry. Here they come. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I'll tell them where to send the vouchers. Uh, here comes the 50 car right now. It's normally an awful lot louder than this and pits almost directly in front of our commentary position and the work begins. Only one air jack. Now, a lot of people are saying um, that's just kind of a bit mean. Uh, it's, I think it's two in NASCAR and uh, as many as you want in Formula One. You're talking about the wheel changes? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, they changed the rules, didn't they? And uh, obviously that, again, is something aimed at, uh, at changing costs, but also you then put a lot of pressure on the tyre manufacturers to actually make tyres that will last longer because you're going to lose more time during your pit stops. So it's just a, another change that the ACV introduced to, that you have to adapt to kind of as you go. We're looking at a 12 car, and we're hoping to speak to Marco Andretti. Uh, whatever uh, job he had to do, he's clearly done, and uh, is back and uh, apparently waiting to talk to us. But we've lived on a promise before, um, and we're still not trusting the side lights lamps, by the way. It's uh, a bit shaky out there. Well, the sailing has got three lights up. Uh, that, in fact, is running third in class, but we have seen some errors. Uh, the second-place car uh, overall, MP1, has been running three lights. So, yeah, uh, we'll try and confirm everything we uh, we have apparently to, apparent to us uh, when it comes to the proper standings and the scoring end. So uh, thanks to everybody who's been on the message boards. Mark uh, Cole has been uh, trawling through some of your notes, uh, which has been a pleasure. So while he's just uh, teeing up, uh, whichever one of you lucky person is going to win the, uh, uh, the, the baby rusk, <laughs> we'll find, that's all we can afford to give away. Let's give it to Ian G. Uh, go he says, I agree with Mark and Carlton. The Audis are looking good and uh, congratulates Liz on her insightful commentary. Keep up the good work, he says. Uh, he's been with us for many years, hasn't he, Ian G? So thanks for it. Keep them coming, everybody. Um, everyone in Belfast watching, they'd like a shout. Here are Belfast. Here's a shout. And uh, also from Northern Ireland, we've got plenty of viewers coming in from there. So do keep sending your messages. We'll answer questions. Don't just tell us comments. Ask us questions. We've got Johnny, Liz. They're here to answer them. Yes, it wasn't a tape uh, spooled back there. Mark Cole did, in fact, read out the same message twice. Uh, just, <laughs> just <to get. laughs> ENG. He's got three mentions now. <laughs> Mark's now flicking pens at me. Uh, here we go. Then. Well, in fact, what has happened uh, to uh, Mr. Abretti? He's gone away again. But we've got Vanina X as a perfect replacement. Vanina X. The race is not going as you wished for, does it? Um, no. Exactly, we had a small problem with the power steering and we lost, uh, I think, about 10 minutes. But uh, as you can see, the race in the front is very fast and everybody seemed very reliable so far, so we have a hard time catching up. What's your program now? Are you getting into the car? I will be in the next stint, yes. For how long will you run? Double, triple, quadruple? I'll try to go for a triple stint, but I have a small uh, cramp problem in the car, so at least two, and I hope to go for three. How is it going with your tires compared to the other Aston Martin? Yeah, we are struggling a little bit to, uh, to let them last uh, as long, so... Hopefully in the night we can we can do triple and maybe four. I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Vanina, uh, she's terrific. Uh, we were just saying earlier on, John. I don't know whether you're here or not. Uh, six different cars, six times a visitor to Le Mans. Um, it's an impressive record. Yes, it is. I mean, she's done a sterling job over the years here in Le Mans, and uh, it's always tricky to come to anywhere where. A member of your family, in particular perhaps your father, was a complete legend, uh, so I always feel for her. But she obviously gets a lot of attention because of her name, but also, to be fair, does a good job as well. So yeah, uh, good, I, I, good, good I, luck to her, and I hope, I hope they get a good finish, because ultimately that's all, all they can really hope for, is, is a, a good, strong finish. Earlier in the week, we had uh, Jack Eakes himself in. He was absolutely charming. As uh, the eight car does a very, very swift nose change and comes out still in P3 it as well. never ceases to amaze me Terrific. with that Audi, how quickly they can change bits of it. I mean, Tom Christen comes in with the rear wing hanging off. It's like five minutes. And he's out there. <laughs> that nose change was about, I don't know, I, I, I actually looked at Carlton, looked back, and they changed it. I mean, I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. I don't know how they do it. And don't forget that before we got the rules that you weren't allowed to change gearboxes and things like that, they could change a whole entire gearbox on their old Audi R8 in like something like three and a half minutes yeah, or something. Did you know, that start with the Bentleys? 
I don't remember if it was no. the first. I thought the Audis I thought it was the Bentleys Audi. did it, and then the Bentleys incorporated it, and then they changed the rules to save costs, and uh, you had to change all the internals, and you couldn't change the casing. So the 95 car uh, are working on that as well. It uh, looks like a fairly uh, routine uh, operation for them. Yeah, impressive stuff. Um, yeah, we were saying, just to go back to uh, Jackie Hicks talking about Vanina, he said, uh, yeah, she's got a famous name, uh, but um, it doesn't always get her a drive because uh, it can be a burden as well. He said it definitely opens doors. But then, of course, you have to step up to the plate and actually do the job. Well, and uh, she's been in various series where it hasn't quite worked out for her. DTM was one of those. Um, yes. She didn't quite get the drive that she needed. Endurance racing, she seemed to have found her home in this one. Yeah, she seems very, very comfortable in these cars, particularly in LMP1, actually, because I've, I've raced against Vanina in various different classes and different races, you know, all over the world, really. And she's, she's always been very, very much at home in an LMP car, which I suppose I can sympathize with because I really enjoy them as well. But she's done a sterling job, especially because she's, she's not very big person either she's quite small and she just gets in these big old cars and monsters them around the track and i have a lot of respect for her for that yeah tremendous uh, there's uh, an all lady crew there was here female crew, woman crew uh, whatever you fancy uh, what, what uh, happened to them uh, unfortunately they caught fire and oh, uh, did natasha I missed that i must have been watching the england match <laughs> oh dear I don't, well don't even tell me the score <laughs> uh, but natasha gishang um she was in a uh, Natasha was in uh, real problems there because the firewall failed and the car filled with smoke and she couldn't actually see where to stop. And when she did stop, she was against the barriers and it was on the driver's side. She couldn't get out. She had to go through the vehicle, uh, which for a big lady is quite some effort. And um, she, she's tall of stature. There's a lot of structure in there to actually you mean get her tall, not big. <laughs> She's not yeah, big. She's well, tall. Just, before she comes <laughs> up and finds you, I'll just... Make her sound like she's I'll an Amazon all, woman or something. All the is she's tall, not, not big in yes, terms of wide. <laughs> Now, wasn't Natasha the one that had that awful accident? Exactly. Yes, and she got out of the car and was hobbling out oh of the car. Oh, my God. So she's not having a good time with it. She's not had a great, you know, few weeks, really. Uh, we've, got, we've got a question here from some of the viewers. Just uh, quite simple questions to answer for us, really. Um, I can answer the first one, and Johnny can do the second. Um, uh, this says, hi, guys. Um, what grade of license do you need to race at Le Mans? Is it International C? Actually, it's International B, I have to say. So that's answered that one. Next question is, what is a typical budget for a pay driver in GT2 at Le Mans? Do you know what? I have no <laughs> I idea. I thought you'd say that. I, I genuinely don't know. I mean, I've been very fortunate to be paid to be here every time I've raced here. So uh, it's about 10, 12 years since I've had to actually bring money to a team. So I'm, I've been blessed. So I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe Liz will know. I, I don't know. And I think the answer to that is it changes every year and it depends on the car and the team. So. <laughs> and, and it ain't cheap. Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> we have Guy Smith standing by to have a chat with us from uh, Rebel and Racing. And again, we've been on a promise. Uh, no, from Guy the, will be there. Guy will be there. <laughs> from Rebellion wait, before. Marco Andretti, I don't know whether they keep mistaking them, but uh, they don't look much similar. Uh, but Guy apparently is waiting for us. So we'll be going down to him in just a few moments' time. Thank goodness. Uh, retirements for you. Uh, the list is getting longer and longer. Shame about that BMW. Yes, uh, and shame about them all, to be honest. I'm starting with the five car early on today. Here he's coming. Guy Smith, the car number 12 has a lot of problem, but your car runs quite well. How do you see the situation? Yeah, it's very unfortunate for the 12 car. Um, they've been going very well, um, doing very good lap times, but they've got some problem with the, with the heat in the gearbox. So they're, they're trying to cure that problem now. Um, the 13 car is largely been uh, trouble free we've had a few small problems but um so far it's going well jc is doing a great job he's doing a, a quadruple st stint right now and then i'll do the same uh, following him so i'm uh, looking forward to it yeah you're running in p10 at the moment is that what you guys expected yeah i mean we'd like to take the fight to aston martin but they're just too quick right now i mean they're, they're, they're still quite a bit faster on the straight um, we'd love to be able to race them on pace, but it's not its not possible right now. So we just do our own race. We go as quickly as we can, try and stay out of trouble, and uh, just see where we end up in the morning. And, uh, you know, if, if we're in a position we can uh, take advantage, then we'll try to. Okay, thank you very much. Guy Smith uh, in the uh, 13 car. And, uh, oh, he's got his 13 on the other side. I thought he was wearing a 12. Yeah, it's good, good, good to see Guy there out, out there. Obviously, um, I know Guy very well from racing against him in the American series. And in fact, we got stuck uh, 
in a hotel together for about four or five days in Long Beach recently when we had the uh, volcanic uh, problems that stopped, basically meant we couldn't get back from uh, Los Angeles to, to London. And it was quite, quite nice to hang out with him. It's nice to see him out there doing well, solidly in the top ten at the moment, and you never know what could happen. Yeah, the ash cloud caused all kinds of havoc. I was caught up in it myself, I've got to say. So we're going to take ourselves a break. It's well and truly night time here. Uh, we're on board with the two Peugeot. It is our lead car, and it's still absolutely pedaling out there. 141 laps completed, uh, with just over 15 hours and 13 minutes remaining of uh, this phenomenal event. Yes, uh, it never fails uh, to uh, just fascinate. It's always a different story, and uh, this one is far from over being told. And I think that's the main worry for Peugeot down there. Every time we go down, they uh, they look uh, ever more worried, despite the fact they're in positions one and two at the moment. It's 50% down so far. Mark Jenny battling back. He's in seventh place at the moment. Welcome back. Uh, yeah, as you can see, it's uh, more than relaxed down at Audi. Just while we were on the break, we were just uh, checking in with uh, the Drayson Racing Lola Judd, which uh, unfortunately is still having its issues with uh, its floor and uh, oil smell, apparently, which is uh, slightly scary. And as we uh, just rejoin Alan McNish here, I have to tell you that um, Marc Genet and the Peugeot, they may have had uh, a brief break, but he's just gone fastest in the opening sector, and he means business. Uh, the air's getting a little bit cooler out there. The tyres are absolutely perfect. There's great vision because it's at night. No, a lot of drivers actually prefer that on occasion because everything's illuminated. You've got to know where the enemy is uh, ahead of you. And also, if you're being chased down, right at the moment, Marc Genet is doing a lot of the chasing. And it's Steph and Mucha, who he will be uh, introducing himself to, I should imagine, on track before too long out here. Just checking in as well with the uh, 76 MacBook machine. Uh, just getting cleaned up and uh, ready to go, refueled and the rest. And nice at last to see the 28 car uh, coming back out here. Um, brief hiatus for them. Uh, they, they took themselves a bit of a spin and had to get checked out. Uh, that's exactly what's happened. Uh, later on this evening, we're going to have uh, Neville Hayes going to be uh, hosting our Up All Night Club. As uh, <laughs> it goes very, very dark there. Uh, Neville, uh, welcome to you. You're welcome indeed. Uh, there's one thing that I don't think you can replicate anywhere else in the world, and that's the Mont Night. There's just something about it, there's a magic about it, and it doesn't matter all the racing that I've been to, anywhere in the world, there's something about the Mont Night that's very, very special. And you say, why do you want to do the night? Because the night spec is the Mont Night. And as you can hear, it's, uh, it's like Dr. Jazz. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be right through the night. Don't be like that. <laughs> and uh, don't fear either. Uh, Eurosport.co.uk, uh, the message boards usually come alive at that time of night because uh, you do generally tend to get a lot of uh, holding of station uh, through the night, although uh, it's, it's mainly because by the time we reach that position, beyond midnight, etc., uh, really positions have, uh, the, the field has been stretched so much that positions can just get a little bit locked. That's when the bad luck starts to happen. And uh, well, by the time we get to, to dawn as well, uh, all hell usually breaks loose. Liz. Well, someone who's definitely finding the magic of the night at Le Mans is Marc Genet. He's just done not only the fastest lap of his car, but the fastest lap of the race wow, right to now. Right. Look at that. For now, in the middle of the night. Three, Marc 20.824, that is He's amazing. done two of the fastest sector times of the entire race, and he is absolutely a man on a mission. He will have had orders from Peugeot to get up there and catch up, <laughs> which is certainly what he is doing. So that's certainly something to be... In well, all, I apparently, think. Frank Montagna was saying, we said, what about team orders? He said, uh, they said, don't break the car. <laughs> Go as quick as you can without breaking the car. Uh, well, clearly, uh, <laughs> that message has been taken on well and truly by Marc Genet in the one car. Uh, Peugeot have uh, been stung by what has been their problem so far. Audi, don't forget, they were cropped uh, behind a uh, safety car, a safety car issue there that uh, cost them about a minute and a half once uh, the five car of uh, Nigel Mansell and the boys sadly in the hands of Nigel, just got into the barriers earlier on and really that uh, hobbled them a bit. They've been on the fight back ever since. They've had their other issues, don't forget, it's not just about that. Uh, but they have been there constantly and it's three Audis chasing down a brace of Peugeots up front at the moment and uh, this is not the lead car but it is running like it intends to be by the end of this race. And Marc Genet, as Liz was pointing out, has just done an absolute stormer. Don't forget, they were trying to dial out the performance of these vehicles and get them to around 
about three and a half minutes on this circuit. But then what did they do? Uh, well, they, they may well dial out a bit of performance, put some air restrictors on the cars, but then uh, they go and uh, alter, uh, relay the uh, Porsche curves and uh, change the Porsche chicane. And it seems that uh, the times have come all the way back down. The magic was uh, 3.20. They thought if it goes below that, that's very, very quick. And we're only, what, three quarters of a second off that mark right now. Yeah, no, this is really quite spectacular. And I have to say, as, as a driver that's been here, I really love this time of night. This is one of the best stints at Le Mans. It's when it's just gone in tonight. It is wonderful experience to be here. The cars are really, really fast when it's dry like it is now because the air is a bit cooler and you're just settling in to getting used to the lights being out and it's, it's just awesome. I love it. And, I, you know, a lot of drivers, I think, do their best times. But certainly to do a time this close to the pole time, is really quite special. Memory. Yeah, it's clear, isn't it, this time of night? It, it's, it's nice and concise, and you've got used to the light fading. Strangely enough, first thing in the morning, I think, is much, much worse, because that's when you can make a mistake. It's a little bit of mist and what have you about. This time of night, you can go very, very quickly indeed. Yeah. Um, oh, hello, well, Mark. Yes, I'm here as well. Yeah, Mark has come, come to join us. Either. Come to greet us. Yeah, I'm looking forward to your uh, your night owl work, as we, say, as we refer to it. The not so small, not so still voice in the night. Not so still. Well, well, it keeps them all away. Yeah. I tell you what, I've got people sending me emails saying we are awake. The demon barber of Worcester. Oh, absolutely. Sweeney Toddy the Soul. While you're having, boys, while you're having a chat, as with the me. LMP2 positions come up, Danny Watts has just been strapped into the Stracker car, taking it over from Johnny Kane. They're still in the lead, and they managed to build up a, a one-lap lead over Brabs now. David Brabham stayed in that car for a long time now. That, that, I, I said it was one lap, actually it's two minutes 15. Brabs has just gone through. So even after that pit stop, they've managed to maintain that lead. And uh, I think there's the problem's going to be when Nick Leventis gets back in, obviously those times are going to fall. It depends what the Highcroft guys can do about that. Yeah, I mean, I think sadly that is the case. And certainly, you know, Danny Watson, Johnny Kane will be doing their absolute best to pull out as far a lead as they can can uh, ahead of David Brabham and, and everyone else in that car purely thinking ahead to give give Nick a bit of breathing room I think so that he doesn't feel under too much pressure and that he can hang on to that lead for as long as he can and still put in consistent laps that he's comfortable doing yeah and then in fourth place we've got the other um, HPD engine car Tommy Erdos he's flying at the moment isn't he he's what one lap down on the Oak Racing car of Guillaume Moreau and uh, if you can haul him in it's going to be a Honda one two three and actually Tommy Erdos has just done the two quickest sector oh. times for that car for the race so like we were saying earlier with Mark Genet Tommy Erdos is also a man on a mission. He's got a good engine car. He's got one of those HPD engines in that Lola uh, coupe. And he's just done his two fastest sector times. He's had his last lap was a three minute 42, which is a quick, which is a quick lap, but not as quick as he can do. But I think this lap we're about to see is going to be pretty special. Neville, you've been watching everything tonight. What, um, what, what, watch quite a bit of it. Yeah. What's been lighting your fire tonight? I think that, well, the surprises rather than lighting the fire, um, the surprises have been that I thought the Astons would probably be a bit further up. We're just going out to the pits, Neville. Hugh de Schoenach. Hugh de Schoenach, vous êtes deuxième pour le moment. Ça marche bien avec le Peugeot Oreca. Well, it's been a big moment for you, hasn't it, with this second Peugeot here? And, uh, well, it's, uh, we've been putting a lot of uh, good, good quick laps. We've got a very good rhythm, a cadence over the circuit. You know, we, we are here as a Ford Peugeot, but we, we've been keeping with the factory cars. So we're, we're still fighting to get that third place. Uh, you know, we try and get back. It's very important for us. And the we've got very quick drivers. The car's been excellent. It is, you know, as quick as the, fact, as the factory cars. Oh. What strategy you got for the rest of the race, Hugh? On va faire des, on fait déjà des triple relais, et on essaiera peut-être dans la nuit de faire des quadruple relais. Well, we're going to look after the car right, right throughout the night. And then later, perhaps the race will come back to us. What position? Well, after tomorrow morning. I think by the time we get to, to midday, we have a good idea where we're going to finish. And uh, I think if everything goes right, and you know, God willing, we're going to going to be there on the podium. 
Merci et bonne nuit. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thank you, good night. Tall order, I think, the podium for that car, Liz, but Hugh will fight to the end. Well, you never know, they're not that far off, to be honest, so, you know, we'll just have to wait and see what comes at the, at the end. I mean, the funny thing is, we are not even halfway through this 24 hours. I it know. seems like we've been here for days, but in fact, well, we have. we're only yeah. just crawling up on the 10-hour <laughs> mark, I think. We well, we have been here for days, but Tuesday. I mean, Neville, solidly just here. Just before Hugh, Hugh to show up, Rudy yeah. interrupted you, you're just going to tell us what's been lighting your fire tonight. Well, the Astons always light my fire, because I love the sound of them and they're not as far up as I hoped they would be. I think the reason that everybody has gone faster than was expected is the changes that they've made to the circuit. It doesn't to do with the cars, really, at all. I was very surprised with the suspension problem with the one Peugeot, and I can't remember who was on at the time, but I thought um, mm, uh, he Pedro, might be Pedro, right about Pedro this. Army. Yeah, yeah, I thought whoever was, was on at the time said uh, this could be the start of something rather unfortunate, but, touch wood, uh, it hasn't happened again. No, but it was electrical, the next car, wasn't yeah. it? So we're, we're down to two Peugeots. Electrical's really, but, one yeah. thing, but when you get sp suspension pulling out, I mean, poor well, old Nigel Mansell, uh, a passenger, I mean, I think, can you imagine, 200 miles an hour, and suddenly you think, oh, no. no it was a, was a tyre, we? we have had that confirmed. It was a yeah. tyre. Yeah. I wasn't sure whether it was yeah. suspension pulled out or tyre. A slow puncture, we're told by Beach Team, when mm. they got the black box back yeah. the car, had a look, they said it's a slow puncture, they had yeah. a, and then eventually it blew, of course. It blew all right, didn't it? Uh, and uh, GT, that's been pretty thrilling, hasn't it? That, GT has been thrilling. That Porsche. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the uh, for, Ferrari against Corvette. Pierre, Pierre Kappler, yeah. what a drive he had. Yeah. Now, do you understand the new regulations as of next year? Because I've asked several people, explain it to me. And yeah, nobody has really been able to put, if you like, meat on the bones. Well, I've just been one GT category. GT1 finishes. Yes, I understood that. GT2 will be called GTE, GT Endurance. Yeah. But within that, there'll be two subdivisions. One for pro drivers, so you can put three professional drivers in the car. Yeah. That car will then race for the uh, pro prize. There'll be an amateur class for, for the gentleman drivers, and they'll race for the amateur prize. But it, it'll still, it'll all be to GT2 regulations. And what G about the prototype size? Prototypes? Uh, New, new regulations next year. As you know, they're bringing down the engine sizes on prototypes. That's what I was except interested Except the cars racing here this weekend, including these, this car, they could, they'll be grandfathered for a further year. They, so they can continue for another year. I'm going to have to interrupt you guys for a minute because Mark Genet has just done a 3 minute 19 Ooh, in fast, the night. Fastest oh lap of the race. Yeah, so I think that's pretty huge, actually, considering that, that that was a qualifying time roundabout, and I think that's telling us that Peugeot had a little bit more in the bag than maybe they showed us in qualifying. Right, now if you're sitting at home in Surbiton with your beer on, the, on your sofa watching our coverage tonight, why is at this time of night would that happen? Well, I think, I think like we talked about a bit earlier, that the, the air is a bit cooler. You know, this is the time when everybody sort of settles in, and I think as a driver you sort of, you settle into the night, you've gotten used to it being dark, you're comfortable in the dark, it's great, you know, well, it won't matter for them because they don't have that many cars coming up behind them. But I suppose for the slower cars, it's nicer because you can see the different lights coming. The, the GT lights are, are yellow and the prototype lights are white, so you know when they're coming. But it's just that magic time of night. You just settle in, and obviously Marc Genet is very, very comfortable. You just hit the sweet spot. That would be the, uh, the answer. I think it's the fastest that we've had, actually, over the weekend. We're going back down to the pit. Another interview coming up. Stefan Zaraza, everything is working well with the number two car. Yeah, at the moment everything is going uh, well. We're happy with the car, so we had a few problems with the number three and uh, the number three stop and number one had a problem also. So it's a very difficult race, very long, so everything can happen and uh, it's Le Mans. You're getting into the car now, I suppose? Yeah, I'm going uh, in uh, 20 minutes. For how long? What kind of strategy do you have? For how many stints are you going to stay in the car? I uh, will stay around uh, three hours. Around three hours will be tough because it's going colder and um, I need to push. Okay, all the best. So Stefan Sarazan uh, just confirming they are doing triple stints in those cars. Ali were talking about quadruple stints, weren't they? But uh, we shall see. Four hours is at this in, in the early morning. That's not too onerous if, if the adrenaline's going and you're focused. Yeah, I think I think a quad stint ends up being around about three and a half hours, just about, because the a stint is usually just under an hour in one of these cars. But it, it's a long time in a car. I'm not going to say it isn't. It is for anybody, but certainly for these drivers, they're fit enough. They're definitely ready to do the job, and this is this is their job. So basically, they just settle in and they do the times. And 
the cars are going really sweetly that time of night. You can just hammer along. And the, the beauty of it is, is that the tire will last for that many stints. Because it's so much cooler, you don't have the heat of the day, it really does make a difference. And I, I would say most of the top drivers, if they can, would quad stint. And the other thing that we just said earlier about the fast times at night, of course, we have lost a lot of cars now. I think we, we've lost about 10 of the entry already. And uh, so the track is getting a little bit less busy, isn't it? Absolutely. And that'll make a big difference. That Every time you get a little bit less car out there, you have less traffic and less stuff to worry about. So that's certainly going to allow these very, very quick cars to go even quicker because they're not going to have so many slow vehicles holding them up. And a lot of the cars we've lost have been some slower GT cars. So, Neville, we say goodbye to you, but you are going to coming back for a long, long shift in the night. Uh, won't call it the graveyard shift because uh, it has all the wrong meanings. But <laughs> Never gets a pat on the back. And just to send him away in style, uh, we've got a message from uh, Jonathan R. It says, Nev, you're a legend. And uh, looking forward to the Night Owl Stories commentary, uh, the Rosé boys at the Demon Barber are all installed and uh, waiting for Nev to start his stuff. So there you go, you see. Uh, the, man. The, the fan base is already assembling. A legend in his own lunchtime. Uh, uh, well done. <laughs> and what a lunchtime it was. Oh, yes. It's still going, isn't it? It started at 11 o'clock this morning. So the one car uh, is uh, finally coming in. Uh, they need plenty more fuel on that machine. It was very, very light and going very, very quickly. Yes, it is. Sorry, I was just reading something else. I had a total moment there. <laughs> I, think, I think we've got a lot of people going very quickly. I've just seen one of the quickest sector times for the Audi number no. 9 car with Timo Bernhard in that. Um, and Timo, a real technician behind the wheel in one of these cars. He was fantastic in the Porsche Spider as well. I raced against him in the American Le Mans series the first year that that car came out. And him and Roman Dumas have been teammates for almost six years. So they definitely work well in this car together. And of course, Marc Genet still pulling out those quicker and quicker times. <laughs> was, just, I, was I going mad? Didn't I just see the, the one car taking a stop? Or was that yeah, he just, he just stopped, just okay, got out. Yeah, Marc Genet. And uh, not only has he just gone out, but he's actually quickest sector th in the yeah, second well, sector. That was before he came in, yeah. All right, thank just, for that. Uh, good point to make, Liz. You, you just mentioned about uh, Bergmeister and uh, Dumas. Mike Rockefeller as well. Those three, basically all Porsche drivers. And people who probably, maybe not be aware, but of course, Audi now owns Porsche. Volkswagen and Audi own Porsche now. So this is why you can use mem family members to bring them into the team. And this is what Audi did very cleverly. Took the best Porsche drivers in the world and put them in their own team for this race. They did, absolutely, which, was, which has been fantastic and a, and a real, real up point for Audi. Um, some confusion as to which channel we're actually on. Apparently we're on both of them at the moment because uh, we're getting uh, two feeds from uh, different directors. I believe we're now crossing to Eurosport 2, but um, all the balls are in the air. Welcome back to Eurosport. Uh, whichever channel you're on, we've been chopping and changing tonight. <laughs> Carlton Kirby, our dear friend here in the studio, totally confused, but don't worry, so are we. Liz Halliday and myself are hot cold, and here we are yes, then. We've been, oh, we've been talking so to the on. ice cream man today. Gets, gets for about better the last 15 and better. Minutes. A lot of retirements tonight, we said earlier, which means that the leading GT1 car, the Thomas Much Ford, has now appeared in the top 21 cars yes, in this yes. race. But the biggest battles at the moment continue to be LMP2, Danny Watts leading David Brabham. This, this is the dream battle, those two. They've been at each other all season, and here they are on track together at the moment, and they are trading fastest laps. 3.40 for Danny on the last, 3.39 for Brabs. I'm actually really looking forward to seeing, you know, how, how Nick Leventis is going to take this when he gets back in, if maybe he's actually going to be quicker in the night and be able to put in a, a consistent time that's maybe a little bit faster. But it's going to be interesting to see, uh, see also if Brabs can reel him in. Uh, Feldmeyer 88 car. Uh, I think they were the ones that had some issues when it came to free practice and uh, uh, actually halted us uh, straddling the track, if I'm not mistaken. The 88 car in uh, Konopka has hands at the moment, it's running 37th, but uh, crucially for them, they're not having such a bad run in uh, GT2, uh, considering the problems that they might have had earlier on. Uh, once again, we're back to Audi. It looks absolutely pristine. Knocked a piece of chewing gum out of place, as you <laughs> can see. It's, uh, it's quite amazing, and how do those boys breathe? Yeah, they're about to bring Timo Bernhardt in. He's due for a pit stop. Whether or not he's going to change, I'm not sure, sure how long he's been in the car. But uh, number eight car in the hands of Marcel Fassler. And those two Audis, first, uh, first and second in the Audi class, uh, which leaves the number seven car in third, Alan McNish. And that's uh, how qualifying was on the first night. McNish managed to raise the stakes a bit. But Liz, 
people keep saying, is this the uh, beginning of the end for the older guys? All these young guns coming in and they're, they're blowing off the old guard. I don't think so. I don't think it should be that way because I would challenge anybody to take on the trio of McNish and you know those those other boys. They're just they're just amazing and they just keep pulling the times out and they're so fast. They know exactly what to do out there and you watch them race and they are so smooth. Every one of them. There's just not a single out of place. And Carlton looks like he's about to bust a cut in a minute. And I'm wondering uh, why. No, I can't tell you. Uh, 72 car. Uh, Gregoire's just to come in uh, off second place. Uh, the Ford of Mush is leading this class. And look at this, uh, it does take its toll out there uh, on everybody. It's amazing that you can actually sleep in conditions like this. Keeping your energy levels up as well. We saw, uh, as we were just uh, uh, making nuisance of ourselves in the Rebellion uh, area, they were just uh, taking on some uh, proper carbs to give them energy later on. Uh, I know it's uh, you yourself, uh, Liz, would, ne would never actually uh, have a, sit down for a proper meal. You'd, you'd basically just keep yourself at a certain, a certain level. It's vital, isn't it, to keep those energy bars coming in? It is, yeah, and you just want to make sure that you don't fill yourself up too heavily. I usually am lucky enough to have a trainer there, and I, to be honest, I try and just say, tell me when to eat and when to drink, and then you make sure you do it properly. So Tim and Bernhard stays on board indeed. Um, just fuel going in, changing drink bottles, checking fluids. No tires there. As we heard, there'll be triple or even quadruple stinting the tires through the night now as the temperatures get cooler. These Michelins are just incredibly durable. That 72 car has been taken into the garage, as you saw, and uh, the front covers are off, and uh, I think it's probably a cooling problem that they've got out there. And as the temperatures do fall, it's getting a little bit chilly out there. Uh, nothing too serious, but we're expecting the... Uh, coldest part of the night to be down to around about 13 celsius and there's a real breeze coming in here as well and it's a bit of a chilly one which gives some respite because we've had a real mix uh, the last couple of days it's been quite muggy oh that's big that is big check that out and uh, we're just on the end of this incident by the looks of things he's uh, managed to bring it all the way back phenomenal effort uh, still can't see because uh, exactly which of the, I think it's the 24 car? No, it is the 24. You're absolutely right. Jean-Francois Leon in the Pescarola, one of the Oak cars. These are the cars that look. Oak, of course, had a podium here last year. Did a great job. Uh, this is Jacques Nicolet's team. In he comes and he's had a big off on that right on that left front lid. Yeah, that, put three wheels on my wagon. That's uh, going straight in. That is a long fix. You can see there's been suspension damage. It's missing an entire left front on that car. Damage to the rear as well. I mean, this is this could be the end of them, to be honest, because um, there is the rule that you must finish 75% of the race, and I believe that still stands. And usually when you come in with a big accident like this, the team clicks a stopwatch and says, when we reach that point where we can't be classified, we, we pull the plug. So I hope for their sake this is fixable. No, yeah, I, mean, I think so, some of you have been asking that exact question. Why do they work so hard and then pull out? It's because that time has been hit. He's yeah. already gone off. That was actually at the Ford chicane because oh. he comes straight into the pit road. Uh, at least he could go that far. Liz, people will keep asking why, when a car comes in that state, why is the first thing they do refuel it? It tends to be a general rule, really. It's basically you, you do all the basics first. You do the refuel, and you get the car ready to just come out of the garage and go. Because basically, if you think about it, when you pull the car out to then go back out, if you had to fuel it, you'd have to push it back, you're wasting, fuel it, waste, you'd send be it away, you're wasting time. Wasting yep. time. Yep. The lead two cars from oh. GT1 are both in the oh, garage. Oh, dear, dear. Now, this means that the Saline, that we were talking about this a little bit early on, might have all the luck in the world because uh, the Saline, I'm just trying to see, is a l on the same lap as the second-placed car and two behind this vehicle. Wow. It might be that the granddaddy GT1 cars start to pull up. We've got... You know, to the, the Celine's been around for ages. The Corvettes are six years old, I think, that are out there, and maybe they're the ones who are going to keep pulling through. And this car looks like it's been around for an awful long time, uh, although the Ford GT, uh, not a Ford GT40, but uh, I think we occasionally refer to it uh, in error. And look at this, uh, no great haste going on either, although uh, there are some pretty uh, uh, nimble hands working yeah, further they're, down. They're working on the engine, aren't they? Corvette being front engine, of course, but uh, as you say, Carlton, this GT1 class beginning to self-destruct. So Julian Rukanal, as he's known uh, in the Celine there, the number 50 car, 29th overall. And uh, he is going to be our class leader in a couple of laps. 
Julian Root Canal. He's that's a dentist. What, that's what they, they call him, yeah. <laughs> and there'll be a nice prize for somebody on eBay, possibly. The uh, nice wing of the Matek car being thrown over the top. Uh, well, it was in such a state. Uh, what I'm worried about is uh, bits of carbon fibre and fiberglass and all kinds of other stuff that have been uh, strewn as it uh, uh, made itself uh, very luckily, I've got to say, uh, back into this area mm. uh, because um, they were in the right part of the track to have a very nasty accident. Absolutely, and we'll just have to wait and see what comes of that. It doesn't look like there's enough debris to cause a safety car, which, which to be fair, a safety car right now would be a bit of a mess. So I think they have to weigh that up when they're looking at do we pull multiple safety cars onto this huge racetrack or do we just carry on? and uh, a little bit more work going on but it's all cleaning at the moment and uh, that little uh, hoop shaped visor uh, just in front of the driver um, is ever so important uh, it may look like absolutely nothing Liz but it serves a, a terrific purpose and it's one of the things that they have to concentrate on it must be absolutely caked in uh, all kinds of stuff yeah it is interesting it really just sort of cuts back some of the the wind drag you get on on your head to be honest which is quite useful safety car's out ah uh, safety car is out yeah. there you go, we were just saying well, it. There's a front, wheel, there's a front wheel somewhere out on the <laughs> Somewhere, track. yeah. Nobody, must, must be close. <laughs> nobody knows where it is. Um, <laughs> it might still be rolling. Yes, on its well way. Be. So for the third time in this uh, 78th edition of the Le Mans 24 hours, we have safety cars on the track. Three cars go out, remember, they do not, under ACA rules, have to pick up the leaders or the class leaders, unlike ALMS IMSA rules, as Liz has told us so many times today. And uh, this is going to play right into the hands of uh, Mr. Mark Genet in the one car here. He's only just fueled, or fairly recently anyway. Uh, he's on track at the moment behind uh, the Lola Aston Martin 007, and crucially, Alan McNish, as well as being on a bit of a charge, they're all on lap 147 as the safety car comes out. A couple of laps ahead of them are Fasta and Bernard uh, Audi, and uh, ahead of them by a solitary lap, uh, again, is uh, Montagne and Lapierre in the Peugeots two and four. Uh, so this is going to bring the field, hopefully, uh, back together. Yeah, but we've got a number of teams waiting in the pit lane, I think, ready to receive their cars for fueling. This is coming at the wrong time for them, because as we've seen earlier, behind these safety cars, if, if you stop, try and go out again, you're going to get held up for maybe half a lap. Well, you know, I've got to be honest, I think it's a bit of a mess. I'm not very impressed by that whole <laughs> sequence, because what we basically do is, ta-da, we've got a safety car. Now, all of your race preparation, all of your hard work means nothing, because it's just down to the potluck of where you might end up behind which safety car and if you get stuffed when you want to come out of pit lane so I indeed, i'm not very happy about per, that i gotta Perge be honest peugeot is held up as they try to go out wow who else is now then, we were just talking up uh, the Selene out there. That's now going to be slowed right down, don't forget. So all of a sudden, a bit of a break for uh, Ford and for Corvette, who are both inside the garage, don't forget, yeah. at the moment. And the se it's the second place car, by the way, Lapierre's car that's been halted at the pit oh lane. Oh, my goodness. He's going to lose a half a lap, or maybe more because of this, because the safety car is uh, it's just coming. First safety car is just going to come past the pits now. Well, you ride your luck, don't you, Liz, here and Mark. Uh, this is absolutely amazing because um, it was against Audi last time by how they were picked up they lost around about a minute and a half they reckoned and right now there is somebody absolutely seething waiting by a red flag for this first safety car as it rumbles by us here we are busy in with the leader of gt1 now this may have actually come to them i don't know a little bit of a rueful look there uh from uh, is it de portales waiting to get back in i think it might be right lapier has been released now he but he's going to join the back of the first of the safety car train it's going to be interesting to see what is going to come of all of this and just a minute ago we saw those corner workers sweeping up shards and shards of car carbon fiber and glass and just just a moment to, to give them a bit of thanks because they work very very hard around this track and I don't think people realize that basically everyone here they are professional marshals and they do work very very hard and, and they keep us running and they keep us safe on the track so just a big up to all of you guys out there thank you very, so very obviously much. that gearbox uh, change they've done on this car hasn't quite worked maybe something else is uh, trying has uh, come up in the laps he's been out he's been out for five or six laps now but uh, not looking good a lot of head shaking going on and that car stuck firmly in the pits well it's a real shame uh, when any of the uh, real competitive cars actually find themselves there but um, they've had their issues uh, like big time and it's all back i wonder if it's all done there's uh, no rush they're not working on it liz mm, it's not a good sign well, they are bringing it up, so let's see. Yeah, no, they're, they're putting it on the hijacks, it looks like. So that's something under the car that needs looking at. 
Um, could be could be gearbox, could be def, who, who knows. After the 11 cars back out, by the way, Emmanuel Piro. Uh, he's uh, running in 37th place, though, and for a P1 car, it's not good news. You know they've had a rough time. They have had endless problems in and out of the pits, not the way you want to be at Le Mans 24 hours. However, they are still running, and there's a good 10 or more cars that are not. So I suppose at the moment they'll be thanking their stars that they are still running, but certainly slightly disappointed to be at the bottom of that LMP1 category. Okay, we've got cars caught in the pit lane now uh, that Guillaume Moreau is just going out now to join the back of the crew he was running in where were we he's third in P2 that's going to hurt him as well because he has got uh, Olivier Pla coming up very quickly behind him just looking a long long way back and I can see the train of cars just through the lights of the Ferris wheel here just making their way but it's still a, a painfully a long long drive for them and I think they've probably got about another uh, 20 or 30 seconds to wait before this second safety car and here they come uh, actually comes through here and it's impossible to tell you which cars have been picked up here because of the flaring lights we can see just about as much as you and uh, we're here <laughs> And one of the things to keep in mind is that it is a lot cooler tonight than we have been. It's cooler than it was earlier on when we had a safety car. So one of the big issues that's going to be here is, is we don't know how long the safety car will be. I don't think it'll be very long, but the tires are going to cool down a lot on all of these cars. So that's going to become an issue. We've got a huge clump of all sorts of different classes in together with cold tires. So hopefully everybody's going to be able to get a bit of heat in there. You can see them trying now. You can't see on the screens the pit lane, but there's a lot of light flashing going on down there. Very, very upset drivers saying, come on, get that red flag in. We've got to get back in. I mean, that has really hurt, as we say, the third place car <laughs> in P2, Guillaume Moreau. And he's furious. He's been flashing yeah. his lights the last couple of minutes. Well, if he uh, had a horn, he'd be hitting it, believe me, uh, because right now the second train has gone by and they're going to be plumb stuck behind them. Right, red flag's been taken in for the pit lane. Out those cars go, but Morrow has been very badly hurt by that. He's almost certainly going to lose third place in P2 as a result. That's a real shame for the 35 car. Frank Kitty was in that train. We saw him, uh, so he's, uh, he's in a fine uh, position as we speak. Goodness me, it's uh, all over the place. I think you, why on earth not have a wave by and just pick everybody up? This just isn't the way to do this race. I'm sorry, it is the biggest sports car race in the world, possibly the biggest race in the world for a lot of people. For me, it certainly is. And I just hate to see, like I've said so many times, pe the fate of people's race being determined on, you know, just where they randomly stick them in a pace car. I don't, I don't think it's right. I'm just wondering whether the, whether the thinking is something to do with the fact that uh, the, uh, uh, the flag may actually change and the safety car might uh, be called in rather quickly. And so uh, they just want to get the race back without having to have too much of a disjointed um, uh, a stop. Uh, Simple as that. But uh, I'm sure there is a good reason yeah. as well. But, but, one can only hope. but why spoil other people's races yeah. doing that? Exactly. That, this is absolutely right. And uh, I'm sorry, here, oh, here comes Daniel Post and then what's all our passes off us? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Liz, you're sacked. <laughs> sorry, Eurosport. <laughs> just looking down on pit lane, uh, Olivier Pla in uh, the Ginetta. Uh, is he going to get held by a red flag? Yes, he is. So the third safety car is going to be weighted here. Flagged way down. He was uh, he was kind of hoping uh, that he could possibly get away with it. There is a bit of a stiff breeze here. All our flags are actually uh, full square on the poles. And uh, as a result, the red flag just looks like a red stick to the yeah. drivers because it's it's uh, planing horizontally. And so the flagman had to work very, very hard. Shame you're not getting a picture of the flagman at the end of pit road yeah, as what, we speak what you did see you saw stefan muckers pit stop in the 007 uh, lola aston martin he's now joined that queue by the red flag and again that car is in sixth place and it's going to hurt him because he at that moment was only uh, what four seconds ahead of mark Genet in the peugeot so that means that place has changed on the track already safety car's gone and uh, we're racing again we're green flagged here you saw the lights were off and uh, away they've gone so you're going to have to forgive us because we're going to have to wait just like you to find Find out who's where after that mess. Uh, well, goodness only knows. Uh, so we're about to find out. Uh, on board with Frank Montagna in the two car. This is our leader, but look how busy it is up front. And when you get trapped like this, you're in all kinds of traffic. It's all compressed, don't forget. And all classes have got an, a very, uh, you know, the perfect right to battle for their own position on track. So why on earth would they give you the wave by here uh, and help you within your race? They're busy doing their own thing. And the, the two car is going to have to respect that. Frank Montagne uh, can see, well, as you can see, what he's seeing right now uh, past the uh, handful.
Koop machine uh, right now and uh, just taking out, I think, uh, out my favorite Viper Green Yeah, that was, the, that was the Chrome car, yeah, yeah. the Chrome Rizzi car. So, uh, oh, yeah. so as you say, we're just going to have to wait for the cars to all land, having thrown them in the air. Oh, oh, oh not again. again. Rebellion These again. These poor cars have had <laughs> such a hard run. This, they this is, uh, really is Jean-Christophe Rebellion. <laughs> yes, it's a watch company, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, he was Ouch. in tenth oh. ten place. That's a big impact, Liz. I, I think, think that's got to be it. We could have seen cold tires taking the best of somebody, or maybe a bit of a nudge. Uh, maybe a bit of both. Uh, I think I suspect that there's still a bit of uh, gravel uh, around the place as well, just to help them out. But um, yes, I think their luck has finally run out. But oh, I think you know when you do a restart like that and you're in all the traffic you know that things have changed a bit you know there could be debris you know the tires are cold so you do have to keep that in mind and most of the drivers will will come through the restart and be a bit sensible you, you know you want to go trust me everybody wants to go but you've got to keep in mind that you're piled in with the traffic Andy Merrick there in the number six car that's the other Areca car the non Peugeot one Andy came in in the car he stayed in it in fact hasn't he so he's being refueled back car was in tenth place just waiting to see what's happening at the head of the field. Our screens are still showing Montani from Lapierre and the two Peugeots, but we're pretty sure that Lapierre will have lost the whole bundle of time. It might be he just had a, had a lap's lead and has probably lost half a lap rather than a full lap. But yeah, but we, crucially, it may well play into the hands of Faster and Bernard. We, exactly. we can't tell you whether that's the case, but they're certainly deeper into the course at the moment. They're just coming out of sector three and going in, sector two and going into three. The car stopped is the 13 car at. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, I'm just hoping that this doesn't cause no, any kind Bulli of safety Bulli issues. Bullion's body language slams the door, he's going to walk away from the car. You get 10 metres away from the car, and that's it. You're then deemed to be out, and look, he knows he's not going anywhere. End of that great car's race. They've had so much work on that vehicle, Liz. I think they may well have just timed themselves out of this one. He's certainly had enough, and he's made the decision. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're just asking him, how far away from the vehicle you, you do actually want to step? Uh, and he said, um, well, the, the full 50 yards, please. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, it, they've not had a great run, or they've no. not had a great week. And actually, Jean-Christophe Bouillon is a really good driver. He's a fantastic driver, yeah. many years with uh, Pascarola, and, um, you know, a lot of great results. So I, I just wonder what those cars have been like he, to drive. He crashed that car Thursday. He did. For, he did. Uh, Wednesday night, remember. He did. And he's done it again. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> No, no, not great at all. It's a busy night and it's going to get busier, except for these boys who are in pack up mode by the looks of things. Right, now what's happened? Nick Lapierre, who we saw held up at the pit lane uh, exit, he has not lost second place, Liz, but he has lost a lap. He was one lap ahead of Marcel Fasler. That's now come down to 79 seconds. Yeah, no, at least we've not seen complete disaster up at the front. However, it could have fallen nicely into Audi's hands, and I don't think it's completely gone that way. They were probably hoping it would, but certainly it's not shaken things up quite as much as it did through that first safety car. No, but they are on the same lap as the second-place car, which puts in a tremendous pressure now on Montagne. He's just a lap ahead, don't forget, uh, of uh, both his teammate in the four car, and then Fassler and Bernard in the alleys with Alan McNish uh, just two laps further behind. Audi have got to have the belief that this is a long game. Uh, we certainly know they have local yellow flash, uh, uh, flags flying here. No overtaking at this point. We're going to have to take our leave from Eurosport 2. And we're heading back to uh, Eurosport International as far as we can gather because... Well, we've been told, just like you've been told, that we're 24 hours uninterrupted, save for the fact you've got to press the odd button or two just to keep in touch with us. Well, the safety car may have gone, but the racing is still just as compressed here. It's busy, busy stuff. In the middle of that light ball, there are an awful lot of cars, as you can see. Uh, we will take our leave and transfer to Eurosport International and maybe see you. A lot of uh, busy activity down there. Um, it's Oli Jarvis in the uh, uh, 15 car. And he's just uh, pitted off ninth place. Uh, Samsonite, Philip P, Tim 70, uh, Sophie Moog, Andy in Coventry, and uh, Gabby, and a whole load of others to I'm so sorry. I don't know where we went. Uh, we thought we were live. We were still belting away down here. Uh, but we'll do our best to resume now that we are back and, uh, and keep you happy. Um, we're certainly, hopefully, 
keep your fingers crossed with you, uh, not going to be uh, leaving again. So there we go. Uninterrupted from now on, hopefully. But uh, sorry for the hiatus. Uh, I know you were off and upset for a little while uh, somewhere in Britain. Uh, I, as far as I know, the Asia Pacific region have been uh, enjoying it from uh, right the way through. But um, there you go. I'm only guessing uh, because we're slightly in the dark. So are we entirely on course here? Uh, 14 minutes and 18. Uh, sorry, let's do that again, shall we? 14 hours, 18 minutes <laughs> and 28 seconds. It's a long, long time to go. We're not even halfway. Can you believe it? It feels like we have just raced for a year. And for Peugeot, it feels like it's been a lifetime uh, because they are looking behind them at the moment. Uh, two of their cars have been in trouble. One of them is really battling it back. One of them is out. The three cars gone. The one car in the hands of Marc Genet is driving so unbelievably out there uh, considering his fuel loading as well he's uh, come in and he is attacking Alan McNish who's out in front of him as we speak Sarazin and Lapierre are in positions one and two uh, Sarazin is on uh, lap ahead but crucially Lapierre and then the Audis of Bernard and Fassler are on the next lap and uh, one behind them is Alan McNish Peugeot starting to look over their shoulders they're looking a little bit nervous down there they're looking a little bit tense others well they've got more serious problems as you can see well, I think that now that Sarazin's just gotten in the car, we might see some pretty amazing times from him as well because he's going to want to pull away in that lead and get as far ahead, uh, there, far ahead as he can. Sorry, it's getting a little bit late. I'm having issues speaking English. Choose their teeth in. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, no, I, I do think we might start seeing something magic from him because these are the sort of conditions he likes and he's going to want to pull that lead ahead as much as he can and make some room. Nice to see Emmanuel Piero come back out here. He's a, a fantastic star of Le Mans. Unfortunately, he uh, has uh, been saddled with uh, what has been uh, a whole load of ill fortune here. Um, it's a terrific outfit, this, but uh, sadly, Mark, they've had a really challenging time. And they're back out. They have floor issues. They've had uh, oil uh, problems, and the back end is coming back off. So they haven't even made it back to the course just yet. I'm sure their, uh, their, their own clock is also ticking out. Yeah, I mean, this car really flattered to deceive at Sebring, didn't it? Yeah. We saw Matt Manorelli Pirro mixing it with the Peugeots in the... Uh, first couple of hours at Sebring. He actually split them all, didn't he? They were so quick around there. But the car has pr proved reliable. It's not got the durability you need for Sebring or Le Mans. That's the big problem. It's blindingly quick, but it's not yet reliable. I think they were a little bit worried about this when they came to Le Mans. I know it's a, it's, it's a big dream for Paul Drayson to be here in an LMP1 car and to have started Le Mans in that front class. So I was very pleased for him that he got to do the start. It's, it's, it's an awesome experience, but I'm sad for them now because it's a beautiful car and I, I, I wanted to see them come out and just storm their way through, but I know it was a worry for everyone. I know Emanuele said they've been working hard to make the car comfortable to drive for everyone. It was a little bit sketchy in practice and, you know, he was doing his best to, to keep that under control, but certainly he's loved driving this car and being a part of this team and being back in sports car racing and pushing hard at Le Mans. And I just hope they get it going again well, so he can get out there with a smile on his face. Of course, he's had more time to do it since his government disappeared from under him and uh, Lord Drayson, who was was at one time the uh, Minister for Business under Gordon Brown's government. That's all changed now. Those of you who follow British politics will know that. And uh, Paul can now concentrate on what he loves doing. But let's just hope this is going to come better as the season goes on. Five times winner of uh, Le Mans, Emmanuel Piro. He almost gets forgotten, doesn't it? Uh, it's such a tremendous uh, record. And um, he's been part of uh, some changes uh, up top, but he's find himself uh, still within LMP1, albeit with uh, uh, the Drayson outfit and they've had a lousy time also it's not been a blessed run either for Ford no it hasn't this has been a tough run for them there were three Fords that came here and only one remains at the moment and only just it's hanging on by a thread after losing its rear wing after contact with a prototype we hear yeah, the BMW have had their issues as well. Uh, they came here expecting a lot. A lot was expected of them as well. Some people complaining that touring cars really shouldn't be part of uh, endurance racing. And I think they possibly got caught out as well. Uh, Liz was talking a little bit earlier on about the performance levels that uh, suddenly they're being met with out there. Uh, it certainly seemed to be an issue with the art car a little bit earlier on. That's the uh, Jeff Coombs design machine. Don't be seeing any more of that. It's uh, one of our uh, black lines of doom, I'm afraid. Yeah, BM, BMW's response to those criticisms is uh, that touring cars have four doors. Our car only has two doors. It's a G2 car. 
money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can't argue that. But, uh, anyway, yes, yeah, so point taken though, Carlton. Yeah, is, is there a place for these cars? We've seen how spectacular they are in the Nurburgring 24 hours. In fact, Pedro Lamy led the team to victory. His, uh, I think his fifth win at the Nurburgring in a car very, very similar to this one. Some of the BMW Motorsport colours. We lost the Coons car, the Art car, earlier in the evening, as we remember. Andy Prio struggling against all odds to get that car to the finish of Le Mans, but it wasn't to be. After four hours, the car was out after so, so many problems. But of course, at the Nürburgring, they ran as one of the faster cars over there, and it would have been a very, very different experience. I mean, a huge number of cars started that race, an incredible racetrack and, and a very challenging race, no doubt, but certainly a different experience from their angle, having been the quickest cars there and coming here being one of the slowest, actually. So not, not slow from the drivers by any standpoint whatsoever, but truly they are in the slowest class. So it's a whole different ball game and, and a completely different kind because of the speed, the speed lid is relative, isn't it? I mean, the a BMW driver going flat out is, is going just as fast as the Peugeot driver going flat out Absolutely. With, within what he's driving. Sometimes the GT drivers are pushing that much harder, actually, because they don't have the downforce that an LMP driver has. They don't have all those sort of mechanical things helping them out. They've got a big old rolling GT car that's sometimes that much harder to drive. They're throwing them around. They're really pushing them hard. So it's just as difficult to drive in those slower classes. Peter Thorpe uh, just coming in as uh, we look at uh, the final work being done on the Corvette here, uh, saying how many different tyre compounds are available to the team? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, actually, because uh, there's, we've heard about soft compounds, soft, soft compounds, hard, intermediate, hard, hard tyres. Uh, how many? I'm, I don't actually know if there's a specific number. I know a lot of it's just dependent on the actual tyre manufacturer and who the team is and all that sort of thing, because obviously we have special tyres, special Michelins for Audi that are manufactured with Audi and that sort of thing. Certainly in most of the tracks I've done, we've had a soft, a medium and a hard. We've not really had a... A, a real big difference around that and then a few different compounds of wet tire and usually an intermediate but generally speaking you've got that sort of range and that you can choose between and crucially some of the compounds are actually thought to be better by some manufacturers uh, than others uh, for instance intermediates is a hankook speciality so if it gets a bit drizzly uh, they may well start absolutely shiny yeah know. and uh, certainly at Le Mans most we, we always used to run a hard compound whenever I raced here I think most teams would be running a medium to a hard because it really is you know, a track that doesn't have a huge amount of tire wear and you do want to triple or quad stunt them as much as you can. Back with a cup of tea in hand, says uh, angry meerkat. <laughs> 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 he said, and uh, just think the racing car is the most gorgeous thing out there. Um, well done, by the way. And uh, he's, uh, he's a happy boy. Just uh, glad to see, yeah. It's that, glad to see them here at, at the very least. And look at this. Uh, it's starting to take its toll on uh, those around. These have a very familiar look, unless he hasn't moved for, for these pictures. I don't think some of them have moved for an awful long time. Uh, if they don't move, um, it's either all over or they're doing rather well, one can only imagine. Uh, the Matmut outfit as well, they've uh, they've had a, uh, a mixed run, Mark. Yes, they have indeed, haven't they? Uh, it's uh, gradually coming back to them there. Uh, just while we're looking at, talking about Matmut though, just looking down the, to the pits, and we just saw the 24 car, the uh, Oak Racing Pescarolo, that had that front wheel ripped off. Somehow, they have got that car back into the race. Richard Hine has just taken it over from uh, Jean-Francois Yvonne, and it's just gone back on track. Now in 33rd place, having been 16. Oh, well, that's fantastic. I mean, that's just going to show what, what hard work these teams put in, and they would have been ready for every eventuality as best they can, and sometimes you just get lucky. They've lost 13 laps, but at least there's two Pescarolos back in the race. Yeah, well, we said it was mixed time by Matt, but uh, they're running second in the four car, which is tremendous, but uh, the Oracle Matt, but uh, they're a mixed team. Uh, I always think it's a bit difficult where you kind of uh, spread your skills across two different uh, types of vehicles. Uh, they, despite the fact that they're still in the LMP1 class, uh, running in 10th place after a few issues down there, and crucially eight laps off the lead. So the seven car uh, for its change here, Alan McNish is in. I presume he's staying in as well. No, no, he's, he's just he, strapping top. Oh, there you go. Sorry, I yeah. completely missed it. I was yeah, no, uh, right, no. yeah. Christensen being uh, strapped in the moment. There he is with those uh, distinctive three feathers on the side of his helmet. Interesting as well, we actually said that they had a very specific change order and they uh, came through that everything. Yep. <laughs> well, all the strategy went out <laughs> after did. That, that first long, long safety car. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Tom went out and uh, he had his own issues as well, uh, requiring a new back end by the we're going to take ourselves a brief commercial break and we'll be back in just a few minutes.
uh, front end issues we uh, thought suspension but they've uh, immediately gone to the back end here obviously a lot of issues on the 39 car uh, the Portellis is on board here now this is likely to promote uh, the GT car of uh, Beretta and the Corvette into the top 20 here and um, that is good news for them but the battle that was raging at the top of GT2 sadly has uh, has come almost to a close um, it's uh, a lap settling se separating now once the Ferrari got into bother there's a couple of Corvettes on top but uh, Patrick Pile uh, is leading the Porsche charge Liz just what it's on yeah we've got one of the Lola technicians actually is uh, is in there working on that car as well so it makes me wonder if it's something a little bit more uh, serious and internal. Uh, well, it certainly didn't look like a quick fix. There's nobody uh, being too busy out there. Thanks for all of you, by the way, who've been in on the website. Uh, we're hoping uh, we may well have, uh, well, obviously, you've got your night thread coming up and uh, your up all night club. I know some of you are very keen on that. The number one car here is busily uh, making its way in. Mark Genet, who's been posting some fantastic times. I think the best time of the night so far, his quickest was what, a 3.20? Uh, 3.19. 3.19, like, yeah. Did six. he get underneath it? I missed that. No, no. I don't believe so, no. No, no, we've been watching that. Uh, so, pace at the moment is around 3.23, 3.24. That seems to have settled down at the moment. But just occasionally, someone like Janae or uh, Sarah Zan will pop a quick one in just to remind everyone who they are and where they are. Just to keep everyone guessing. Keep you all awake. Yeah, terrific. So, he's uh, in his box at the moment. Uh, Peugeot's one and two with the Audi Bernard and Vassler in uh, second and uh, in third. I should say, Mark Janay pitting off that fifth spot at the moment, uh, but he's on 157 uh, laps as opposed to 160 for our lead car. Um, it's still in the hands of Peugeot, but it's by no means certain here. They're just starting to look a bit fragile, off mood, and, uh, and in other departments as well, Mark. Yes, Peugeot mechanic really attacking the car there. It tried to eat him, he got out, and he jumped on it and thumped it. <laughs> I think he won. He won, yes, he won. He did. Yeah, faces like thumped. <laughs> and uh, when, when you uh, when you think that they're actually in P's one and two here, with Jelly posting some fantastic times, quickest on the night, uh, as Bernard sends in an absolute steamer of a 3.23 here. Uh, that is a full five seconds quicker than Sarazan, who's uh, not a slow man, who's on course at the moment in the two car. It's impressive. That is very impressive. And Timo has just put in a new fast sector time for that car as well. The first sector is even quicker, so he's really yeah. pushing through the S's and Pedro is running. So this is our Anthony Ant Davidson on board the number one car as we go out and uh, he rejoins the fray in fifth place just ahead of the Audi of Tom Christensen. Uh, maybe it's not even that because it was 28 seconds. Let's see how that pans out. 26 cars running, running slow, Mark, and uh, oh, that's yeah. bad, bad news Very bad as well. News. Yeah, they've been uh, uh, deep in trouble, and uh, but they were hoping to get a climb back. They are in uh, in second place in class, don't yeah. forget, uh, running in 13th place, and it's just suddenly gone back uh, bad for uh, HPD. Uh, they haven't been in trouble. They've been running rather well, but it's starting to come to them now. You're, you're, you, you've got so much luck out there. It's almost like an egg time at the Sands. I've actually run against them. Here. It's been in the hands of Frank Ketty, and it is slow in uh, the second place in LMP2 at the moment. Uh, Dan Watts is going to be on his lonesome if uh, Moreau can pick himself up here. He's got a three-lap deficit. That's how dominant the HD, HPDs have gone. They've yeah. been so, so adept, haven't they, Andy? Well, in fact, fact Danny will have a four-lap lead if, uh, the, if Frank Ketty loses a lot more time. And, of course, that will help Nick Leventis. When he takes the car over again, he's going to have quite a big buffer in his favour. They will. They will be absolutely thrilled in the strategy the racing pit right now that something we don't know we haven't seen it on the track yet but something seems to have slowed the high cross car with Frank Heady in it and I think what we're seeing what's been dominant is the HPD combination with that old Acura body that, that, that those cars have because there is an HPD as well in the Mike Newton car which is a few cars back KSM uh, 39 machine is in trouble and what it's done is it has helped to promote two GT cars, uh, GT2 cars, uh, both of the Corvettes are now in the top 20, 19 and 20 overall, they're the class leaders and uh, this is uh, Alan McNish, I'm hoping we can have a brief chat with him. Well, we hope to catch up with him in just a few moments' time. Uh, right now, we're downstairs with the 25 car. Yeah, I don't think you're going to hear from Alan, because that was Bruce Jones, of course, of Radio Le Mans interviewing him. And uh, I hope just, uh, Sebastian will call, catch up in due Yeah, course. just pulled him out of the side of my yeah. eye. Here, then, is the what, what is now the fourth-place car. Mike Newton still on board the Ray Malik. 
Lola HPD, just talking about the HPD car there. Uh, just to remind you as well, the, the, the car that's leading that class, Danny Watts' car, that was Adrian Fernandez's uh, LMS car of last year. Uh, is, it, is it identical spec to the Highcroft car? Well, when I spoke to some of the guys working at Highcroft, they did say they felt it was. They said, because um, I said, oh, I heard there were some differences. They said, no, we've been told they're absolutely identical. But this, so, this engine go. has just been an absolute pearl, hasn't it? Yes. And already we, we've been told already that there is a new co engine coming from HPD next year. It'll be turbocharged, won't it? Uh, V6 turbo, which will still meet regulations for GT2. Yep, and, the, uh, and it's actually an ex Indy car. Oh, is yeah, this a new no, accident or is this the old one? No, yeah, that's the old accident. Again, yeah. yeah, no, the HPD is actually an ex Indy car engine, so it's very interesting that it's come in and been so strong. I think what they're showing us there was just how that car came into the pits, how it went out again after this accident, and uh, they repaired it and it's got back out. That's the 13 car, Jean Christophe Bouillon going off at the restart on cold tyres. You can never, ever be safe, can you? three stops it's hard to know exactly what happened there we couldn't really see the whole accident but it, it could have been that i mean to be honest jean christophe he, he would know how to deal with a restart he's certainly had enough experience so it makes me wonder if maybe something else happened but it's very hard for us to tell here at the yeah we're time. just trying to find uh, one of you's uh, been uh, uh, on our message board saying what has happened to the uh, 60 car philip p we're still trying to find out uh, it's still in the garage unfortunately but um, it was uh, going so well it's still running third in class despite the fact it's uh, 35 on course so uh, yeah. we're just uh, trying to uh, find out exactly what the issue is. It, it had impact with the prototype. I, I definitely know that for a fact. Um, and it lost the rear wing yep. to the pits, but I do believe they are still working on yeah, it. Yeah, there is. It's, it it sort of it's more serious than that. It's a bit sheepish cap in hand going, yeah. oops. So I think perhaps it was his fault. They have changed the whole back end on that car. 64 then. This is the lead GT2 car. Oli Beretta bringing that car in to uh, hand over. Is he handing over? No, he's staying on board. They're not taking tires on either at the moment. Just fuel. This is really Corvette Rolex smooth, isn't it? It's amazing. Uh, they are celebrating 50 years at, uh, of competition, and um, they've been doing it in some style. They've uh, they've had some of their old uh, peddlers uh, uh, back here, uh, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure actually to see their joy, and and the fact that the program goes on and uh, that GT will be graced by Corvettes for an awful long time to come, despite the fact that GT1 is coming to a close. They're going nowhere, and right now they. <laughs> we say that, but right now they're leading the class in a superb form. Uh, we finally discovered, by the way, what the uh, incredible noise we've been hearing several times a day is. Uh, it's a huge horn bellowing out over Le Mans. It turns out it is a ship's foghorn powered by compressed air, which Corvette had put above their pit. Really? Asked why, they said, because there's nothing in the regs to say we can't. <laughs> So there we that have. is fantastic. <laughs> we like that. I hope everyone was tuned in to Eurosport then to hear that. That is awesome. <laughs> Go on the American team. <laughs> so, so, guys, uh, we're just about to hand over uh, for the, the late shift. It'll be uh, Martin Haven, Jeremy Shaw, Neville Hay, and Chris Parsons uh, taking oh, you the through dream the team. Night. The dream team. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, we will uh, try and marshal them towards uh, the website so you can ask them a few questions if you wish. Eurosport .co.uk, uh, click the message boards, scroll down to motorsports, and if you click them all and the topic area, that's uh, the thread, uh, it's new exclamation mark Eurosports 2010 Le Mans Live. So uh, I'm sure you'll be uh, very happy in their company. Time for us to take our break as uh, the nine car gets back out on course. The lead Audi is uh, out and racing and holds station in uh, a provisional podium position of third as we speak. Hello, welcome back to Le Mans. Just a moment or two ago, onboard shots during the middle of the night here from the Audi, just picking its way through traffic as Audi currently lie third, fourth and fifth with Peugeot first, second and six positions. And you're looking here at the LMP class, LMP2 class leading battle. Marino Franchitti leaving after service in the Highcroft Acura. Joe Bradley of Radio Le Mans there getting in shot. And Danny Watts still leading the class for the Stracker team. And again, much to the surprise of uh, the assembled masses, the Japanese Lamborghini Owners Club, Mercia Largo, 
is still going. This year's car clearly then a uh, very much more fettled version of the Mercy Largo than they had last year. This is a brand new car provided by Writer Engineering, who are Lamborghini's development team. And so far, barring one puncture, they seem to have been almost entirely trouble free. So uh, there you go. Now, do get it refired, and away it goes. And I have to say, even in terms of relatively short GT races for Lamborghinis, uh, it is having a very good run so far. Hello, everybody. Just under 14 hours of the race remain. And we are now properly into the darkness hours here at Le Mans. After a very wet morning, it has taken a while to clear. And we have now got a cool and clear night. It's been dry right from the start after a wet morning warm-up. And conditions now really ideal for fast lap, and that's borne out by Nicolas Lapierre in the number four Orica. Which is just about to come in for a pit stop. He's just turned the lap in three minutes 26, which is a pretty reasonable race pace. Uh, he's got uh, another half a dozen cars around him doing similar. And Davidson, three minutes 24 in the last lap. Looking here at the uh, Porsche, which Timo Scheider is taking over or handing over. At the moment, he shares with Marco Holzer and Richard Westbrook, and we were talking to Richard Westbrook a little bit earlier. Very disappointed with the new race engine they fitted to this car. It apparently is flatter than a flat thing on flat day. So it's got uh, no torque whatsoever. They've been consistently backing off wing on the car and trying to give away grip in the hope that it might drag itself off a corner. But unfortunately, it seems to be an awful lot less impressive than the race they, uh, the engine they had in for qualifying. Unfortunately, occasionally, that's the way it goes. I'm joined in the booth now uh, by Chris Parsons and Neville Hay. So, first of all, good evening, gentlemen. Good, good evening, Martin. Oh, good evening, Martin. Very nicely done. Well done together. Uh, Roman Belleville steps out of the Celine, which, uh, if we catch up on our GT1 positions, is currently... Uh, Oh, I'm lost. Third one. First in GT1. They're scattered so liberally down page two of the timing screen. Yes, I can see it now. There's not a burly bloke in the way. That one green light signifies he is in first position. And there'll be two red lights on the side of this car because this is not the Celine. This is now our second place car, the Oreca Peugeot of Nicolas Lapierre. And after Peugeot started so dominantly with cars running one, two, three, and four. They have lost car number three, courtesy of a rare suspension failure, and car number one with a serious delay due to some electrical gremlin, bless you, Jeremy Shaw, in the background. So, gentlemen, what looked like being a very long and painful 23 and a half hours waiting for Peugeot's axe to fall and to have a one, two, three, four finish, suddenly seems to have turned into a a much more edifying prospect. Yes, the whole whole thing seems really very open. Although the, the weather, which was the the one factor that we thought would would be here, would be the the, the limiting factor here, um, looks fairly set now for the whole the rest of the race. Although it is quite cold outside and the wind is blowing from, from the north, which means that it could blow but blow the rain back. But. Um, I believe for the next two hours at least things are set, uh, although towards dawn there might be some rain, which yeah. will upset things again. That's yeah. the sort of prognostication that over the last couple of days we have heard accompanied by claps of thunder. There will be no more rain <laughs> for the rest of the evening. Quick, let's hide from the lightning. Yeah. No, nothing they say convinces me about the weather here. Uh, all the years I've been coming to Le Mans, and I've been told, oh, it's going to be scalding hot, and it rains. Oh, it's going to rain, and it's hot. It just, it, it is a little bit of a lottery, but um, they do say, you know, that's an old story about Dame David and the Fat Lady Sings, and I've got a feeling that this race, it had a sting at the start, and I think it might have a sting in the tail somewhere along the line. I don't know why I think that, but I've had this feeling all the way along the line. Well, there's always lots of twists and turns, and there have certainly been quite a few so far, and they're not just in the front-running LMP1 category either. Here's our erstwhile GT1 leader, for instance, the Maytek Ford, which looked pretty rock-solid in the GT1 class, of course, involved in the accident that brought out the safety car that is currently third in class, but has been on pit road for a very long while. 
completed 129 laps to the leaders 138 so that's a very long way to try and catch up on pace that ain't going to happen even in 13 hours and 50 minutes no. they're going to have to wait for something else to break on somebody else's car and as you can see still trying to uh, chop bits out of inner wheel arch liners to get the bodywork to go back on and at 200 and odd miles an hour actually you do quite need it to fit that's rather important you, you don't need your bodywork flying off at those sort of speeds you don't miss it uh, in, in the pits, sorry i didn't mean to make that quite so uh, camp in the pits is the wr which is climbing slowly up the up the order now knocking on the door of the top 30 31st place for stefan Cellini as he jumps out and gurns the camera and uh, not, a, not an auspiciously quick car, but it seems uh, much against the run of form with Cellini's. Uh, we're sort of echoing the, the Japanese Lamborghini program here. Seems to be keeping itself pretty much out of harm's way. And that is rule number one at Le Mans. Stay out of the pits because you go a lot quicker when you're going on the track. Talking of that, uh, Martin, the, uh, the, the car that's really surprised me today is the, um, the, the HPD, the Stracker car. Um, of Danny Watts, which really has had a very clean run. Everyone thought that the um, the Frank Kitty car would would be the leader of that class, the Frank Kitty, Frank Kitty Brabham car. But no, the Danny Watts Stracker car has had a very clean run and doing very well. well now, have, what three laps? Yeah, they're, and they're two cars that really are the class of their respective fields. The Stracker team have been very much the class of the LMS this year uh, in the LMP2, and the Highcroft team, which uh, Marino Franchitti has joined for the long-distance races as a driver rather than just as a member of the crew, that's been very much the LMP2 class leader in the American Le Mans series. So it is sort of the clash of the two titans, and the uh, Cura chassis is definitely a new generation of LMP2 car. It seems to be just a step ahead of the Lola chassis. In third place, in fact, is uh, Olivier Pla. In the uh, fourth place is uh, Olivier Pla in the Ginetta Zytec, the uh, number 40 keeper ASM car. But the Pescarolo Judd of Guillaume Moreau, uh, currently the young French driver car in the Oak Racing uh, organization, Mathieu Lahay joining him and Jean Chirou's not that French, the Czech, but uh, mainly young French drivers. Uh, that is currently lying third in class, but it is a battle basically between the Acuras to see who blinks. The GT1 Ford leaves the pit lane as John Clellan settles down in his armchair with a large glass of Armagnac. Do you want to hit him, Neville, or shall I? Well, I think we're basically the least he could have done was give us a bottle. <laughs> Clelland gives someone a bottle. Yes, I, think I know. That's very unlikely. Very unlikely. In is the 11th place, Lola Aston Martin. This is a double eight car. Vanina X is at the wheel at the moment. And this is one of the three Lola Aston Martins, of course. Pierre Rag, Vanina X, and Frank Meyer driving this car. They're in 11th. The other two cars, the golf colored cars of uh, the Aston Martin racing team, 007, 009, they are 7th and 8th. Adrian Fernandez and Sam Hancock, respectively, at the helm of those cars. We're going to take a quick commercial break and be back in just a second with more live coverage here from the mob. Welcome back live to Le Mans. You could only be in one place, couldn't you? Lights on, it's night, and there's the Dunlop Bridge. World's greatest endurance motor race continues. Looking here at our G uh, LMP2 class leader, rather. The, uh, in fact, that's not. That's the key player SM car that lies in fourth place in the car, which is uh, the class led by the number 42 Stracker Racing HPD engine Acura chassis. Acura in second place as well with the HPD engine in number 26, Highcroft car, that's the green and black machine. Third place in the class, as we said, Lola Judd of Guillaume Moreau. And gentlemen, you can see the mechanics now starting to feel the pace of having been up at probably six-ish this morning to get into the track, ready for nine o'clock morning warm-up. Um, the 24 hours of Le Mans, of course, is about a 40-hour shift, really, isn't it? It's the catnap club. <laughs> and uh, walking through the paddock on my way up to the tower, my God, there are some very, very tired faces already. Tired and emotional, or just tired? No, just tired in the paddock. They're emotional outside. Yeah, there's the emotions outside running fairly high. The, the odd thing about.
about this race is that there isn't anything like it anywhere. The more at night, as I was saying earlier on, an hour or so ago, it is just special. But the thing that I find uh, even more daunting is that now there's quite a lot of this circuit that is quite well lit, not just the pit area. And then you go out here uh, and onto the Molson or what have you, and it is very, very dark. Don't let those pictures fool you. It's a lot darker than that if you're sitting in the car driving it down here a couple of hundred miles an hour, I'll tell you. It's a couple of hours ago I tried to get down to Arnage at the other end of the circuit, and it's absolutely impossible. The car, there are so many cars, buses, people walking, bikes, motorbikes, everything. It, there are just thousands and thousands of people here. And, and, uh, the night is the, is the great thing here. I mean, I can remember as a... A youth sort of coming here, uh, and also taking my boys here as well, and going out on the Mont Saint, you know, oh, it was just the most unbelievable feeling. You could move around a lot you easier could in those, those days. days. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why there are so many thousands of people jamming the roads with their cars and their buses and their bicycles and scooters and everything trying to get out there because it is the one race in Europe, really, that has anything like this. I mean, we'd argue that there's nowhere quite like this in the world. Daytona obviously has a lot more night in its 24 hours. Sebring goes into the dust, but Le Mans really is unique in that aspect. It doesn't have the longest night, but it is a dark night, and particularly out there in the forest, we're talking the Mulsanne Armstrong, we're talking Arnage and Indianapolis, where we're racing up towards now at really very high speeds. The Peugeot right up behind the Highcroft Acura and making it look like it's standing still as they rush up towards Indianapolis over the kink where the Mercedes flew all those years ago with Peter Dunbreck on board. And at 220 miles an hour, stabbing the brakes, turning into Indianapolis, down here into the second part of Indianapolis, probably doing little over 100 kilometers an hour. And then one of the more difficult corners, even though it's the slowest, because you always feel that the squirt up to Arnage, you need to carry a bit more speed, but the braking is so important there, you can just skate off the track within a heartbeat. And then heading down again on public roads, you can see the dotted lines in the middle, now the, the curb stones at the side, the mile markers and the trees have all been moved back a little bit. But to a Bentley boy from the 1920s, to a Jaguar driver from the 1950s, to Steve McQueen in the 1970s, that view, Neville, has remained pretty much unchanged. Yeah, totally recognisable. Funny enough, I went out um, on uh, Friday night for a meal and I went down towards White House and I was explaining to the guy who was with me, do you realise that this is where the circuit used to be? You can still see the safety bank as such mm -hmm. and you see where White House is and I said this is where in 1927 the Bentley team all involved in this and then uh, 10 years later uh, there was another accident there which sadly cost the life of um, uh, a South African driver, Pat Fairfield, and that was the scene of very, very many of the difficulties that arose over the years. They changed it, and of course they changed with the Ford Chicane. It became an awful lot safer uh, in this particular part of the circuit. Same time in, up there, uh, I was here when John Wolfe was yeah. killed in the... Uh, 917. In the uh, first yeah. of the 917s, and uh, after that, and the, and the width of the circuit there is so narrow, and, and as you say, there are ditches either side and banks and houses. It's, it's quite incredible. No safety factors whatsoever. Now, I mean, if you look now at these cars, yes, we know that corner and forces and everything are that much greater. But when you think of the thousands and thousands of miles that drivers have put onto these circuits with the Jaguar team, with the Aston Martin team, and some of the things that... Uh, sort of amused me is that, you know, when uh, we had Archie Hamilton uh, at today in the Porsche race, in that C-type Jaguar, which the Hamilton family still own that they won the race with, is the orange. Because Gunga always had oranges in the car. And there is one of the oranges in that car. It's still in the car to this day. If any of you have not read the, the, uh, the Duncan Touch Hamilton Wood. book, Touchwood, you really ought to. It's one of the funniest books about motor racing. Some of his exploits were, were just tremendous. He did have some uh, very amusing times, I think is the nice way of putting it. Yes. Um, another book that, uh, that I've just read, which is well worth reading, is uh, called Go Like Hell. Uh, which is the the story of the Ford Ferrari battles in the in the 60s and 70s, 
and uh, we see the GT40s or the Fords here today, the Ford GTs, but it was the GT40s and the Ferraris in those days. And it's, it's an excellent book building up about, about the battle between the two, the two companies. Well, it really came about, of course, because um, at the time, uh, Ferrari uh, was uh, undoubtedly very successful in Grand Prix cars and in sports cars and everything else as well. And uh, for a reason best known to himself, Henry Ford decided he wanted to buy it. And it didn't happen. And I think there was a little bit of spite and, well, if you can do it, I can do it, came into it. And the Ford Motor Company, uh, everything went quiet for a little while. And then Eric Broadley, that self-same Eric Broadley who headed up Lola and the cars we see, Lola cars out here today, designed a car uh, which was actually at Le Mans in 1963. There were two of them here. And these cars made a huge impression upon Ford. And so basically what happened is they bought the design and at this point in time this i thought was the amazing thing we watched actually two very very uh interesting little battles going on there um i'm just break away from that for a moment too uh, that's, the, that's the recovering Audi of Christophe Boucher, yeah. one of the two college cars. Now that was up well up into the top ten and is now slumped now into 14th place, just coming out of the pits. And uh, in the pits at the moment is our race leader. So Stefan Sarazan receiving service, stays in. Sarazan, of course, very disappointed, disgruntled to lose a chance to claim a fourth consecutive pole, but... He started from pole three times for Peugeot and has yet to win a race. Didn't start from pole this year, but is leading the race. So I guess perhaps you'd give up those Thursday and Friday headlines if you got the Monday morning headlines and the chance to take that trophy home with you. Take a quick commercial break here and we'll be back live from Le Mans in just a second. Stay with us. Welcome back live again, joining Stefan Sarazan in his Peugeot, fresh from the pits on board just a moment or two ago, working his way on cold-ish tyres. They'll be straight out of the tyre oven, but not as hot as they would have been at the end of the lap as he works his way through traffic, through the S's, catching up to the Racing Box Porsche. Uh, racing box Porsche, the BMS Scuderia Italia Porsche, uh, rather through the S's, and the witching hours are upon us, uh, boys and girls. Neville Hay, Chris Parsons, and Martin Haven here as we head into the night. Wherever you are uh, across Europe, it's now officially starting to be Sunday, and wherever else you are across the world, it may be heading towards Monday or getting into Sunday morning. But whatever. The focus of an awful lot of attention, Formula One fans and elsewhere, is on this race at Le Mans because, Neville, it, it has still got an enormous cachet about it. Over the years, manufacturers have come and gone, different eras of cars have come and gone, but for all, and perhaps because partly of all its unique Frenchness, with all that entails, positive and negative, Le Mans is still one of the world's great challenges. Oh, tremendous challenge, you know, I mean, we welcome insomniacs here at Le Mans. Um, and I, I said, I think this battle is over. We were talking about the GT40s. And uh, it's been gorgeous to see these cars. I'm just so sad that they haven't given a really good account of themselves. But perhaps they'll come back another year. You know, when the GT40 first appeared, we were talking about when uh, the Lola was bought by Ford, they had a whole load of people developing it. They had uh, Phil Hill, they had uh, the uh, other great Richie Ginther driving it. Everybody had a go at it. And the one thing they couldn't get right, actually, was the aerodynamics. That was the thing that actually caused them to come here on the practice days, the test days, and write the cars off And when they came to the first event. And it was just purely, sort of, after everybody had bitten at it, that the old lag, one of the team, who sort of was a great friend of uh, Wires, Wire liked him because he could say, right, well, look, get in it and drive it. And he drove it as fast as it would go and didn't actually ask any questions. And the old lag said, I think it's the aerodynamics. And do you know what? He was right. They put a spoiler on the back of the handle there afterwards. 
Well, of course, Ford had those problems with the GT. That's yes. number one. Yes, that's Anthony Davidson, unfortunately. Yep. Um, car that led the race until it had an electrical problem, and that is at the S's. He's gone off yep. down in uh, Est de la Chapelle. Of course, this modern uh, version of the S's, very much different from the old S's, which were uh, snaking down through high wall banks in the forest. This has been introduced for the motorcycle Grand Prix, predominantly in single-seater racing. And he gets pushed out of the gravel trap there. He's going to find himself back towards a bit of terra more firma. And that would have cost him maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Yeah, I'd We'll take a look so. at the lap time next time round. Last lap was a 3 minute 21.6. And the fast lap by the leader was a... Uh, fastest lap we've had so far has been a 3 minute 21. So he's right down there on the outright fastest pace. And it's as... Ah. Usually is the case, a mix-up in traffic. And yep. putting himself down the inside as I wasn't quite sure what it was, actually. I was looking at the timing screen when the replay started. Somebody, anyway, pinched an inch or two. Also a spin. Ah, oh, it it looks as Alphorn. if they got together, yeah. Yeah, it was one of the Alpha Venture Corvettes, I believe. Now there is one of them going strongly in second place. Xavier Masson in the 73 car. So we'll take a look at his next lap time. His last lap time was a four minute flat. If we remember in four minutes, we'll have a look back. And Davidson did a 321. Now they've come together and both gyrated. Hopefully no major damage done. But in any situation like that, particularly when you're doing the sort of speeds they are now, as we ride our board with him into the first chicane, where again, he's trying to find yeah. catch up room now inside what looks like the 008 uh, Signature Plus team, Lola Aston Martin. Whenever you have contact, particularly with the speeds they're doing here, Bev, you want to be really sure that the car is still in one piece, but yeah. you haven't got time to check. You've just got to get on with it flat out again. Yeah, you, you really feel the, probably the, 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 the desire to come in and let ha, let them have a look at it from the outside, even though it's very briefly is there, but it's a chance you can't really take if you can avoid it. You know, you, you want to carry on. And he took a lot of gravel on as well. You can yeah. see it flying around, so you'll see it again. Well, this is a replay, yeah. and you can actually see when it gives a sudden jerk that what's happened, I think, possibly, the Corvette driver didn't see him. Yeah, well, he, he may well have been blinded by the headlights as he came in, but it's no. very hard to tell. And the simple rule in, in motorsport is the faster car must make the clean pass, that a clean pass, and you expect the other driver to stay on the racing line, so you've got at yeah. least some idea of predicting where he's going to go. Well, it was the late Dennis Jenkinson that said uh, a piece of advice that he gave to all drivers, was, look, stick to your line. He wants to come by you, let him find his way, but don't do anything to help him because you'll probably make it worse, you'll hinder him. Well, we saw that early in the race where Andy Frio tried to give a little bit more room to uh, Alan McNish in the number seven Audi as they got into the Ford curves, uh, Porsche curves rather, and uh, unfortunately, uh, McNish was already committed to the outside. I can remember a thousand kilometer race in Brands Hatch where Jochen Mass was taken off at enormous yes. speed. Uh, by a car doing exactly that in clearways, moving offline. Yep. Mass was committed to the around, to go around the outside, and he had a huge rant about it, and uh, and rightly so because if you don't stay on the racing line, there is no chance the driver following you can predict where you're going. If you stay on the racing line, as Davidson comes by the pits and eschews a chance to come in, it obviously feels okay. If you don't stay on the racing line, then all bets are off. There's no idea where you're going next. So give the guy a fighting chance. He's good. He'll find a way past. That was, the, that was the Pink Panther, by the way, that, that uh, it was. fell over. Yes, I wasn't going to yeah. um, uh, bore everybody with Roy Baker racing uh, Tiger stories, but uh, <laughs> since you brought it out, uh, we won't bother them any further. Do you remember who was driving? I don't. Yes, um, yes, but I won't I won't, no, uh, won't, won't, won't uh, criticise him. Well, well, tell, tell us when we're off air, will you, and then we can basically pretend oh, we knew all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, here is the driver change getting ready to happen for the 73 Corvette. That's Julien Jus, uh, last year racing in the FIA Formula 2 Championship, so obviously coming from a single-seater background, as does his younger brother, or as his younger brother is currently in. Xavier Masson, also an ex-single-seater driver, and their uh, slightly more elderly third driver, Patrice Goulard, who's been a long-time supporter of GT racing. Uh, he's 44 compared to 24 of Jus. Uh, who is the younger member of the team, youngest member of the team, and he's getting ready to take on that 73 car. And uh, what do 
we say Formula X 7.3. Oh, and we've got another car off. Car number 63 in the gravel traps. That's the Corvette of Jan Magnussen, Johnny O'Connell, Antonio Garcia. Our GT2 class second place car. And post 96, which is nine kilometers into the lap. Oh, that's the fast. No, that's the slow left hander at uh, Indianapolis. I was trying to work out where it was, yeah. My map tells me. Yeah. Down, uh, sad, sadly, uh, if I remember rightly, Mr. Magnuson's son has started racing, hasn't he? Oh, yes, he has. Kevin. It was quite worrying, that, you know. Uh, and very well, yes. Yeah. Kevin seems to be equally adept in throwing a single seat around as the old, well, it's not fair to call Jan Magnus an no. old man yet, even though he is a father. Uh, 36, no, I don't think that qualifies as old. No, so no young Kevin Magnussen, still 16, very, very capable indeed, it seems. Very short Grand Prix career for Jan Magnussen. I think basically the atmosphere that surrounds Grand Prix racing didn't suit him very well. Uh, he looked to be having the right place, the right time, but it all fell over for him, didn't it, Martin? Yes, I think he was quick enough. I just think it just did his head in, and he was either too young for it or just actually wasn't the kind of guy that will deal with it. However, he has con continued to carve himself a very successful racing for his sports cars and uh, a, a real linchpin now in this Corvette program. However, they were running first and second, the two Corvettes. They were about two minutes apart. In fact, it's Johnny O'Connell in the car, in the gravel, still in the gravel, we believe, and up to third place now in the GT2 class has come the lead Porsche. This is the 77 Felbermeyer Porsche, the blue car driven by Mark Lieb, uh, and Bob Hensler and Richard Leitz. So no even uh, vague pretense of having a Felbermeyer or a Gerald and Christian Reed that Proton used to run aboard the car. Felbermeyers are in the other car. The three factory drivers are in the 77 car. That's now up to third place. Car 63 has rejoined. And maybe now at half past one, just have a quick scoot down the order. If you want to find what the times and positions are yourself, and particularly if we haven't referred to your favourite car for some while, uh, either A, because we've forgotten to, or B, because it's retired, you can go to lemon.org on your laptop or your computer and have a look at their timing and scoring. That will tell you everything. So our overall leader is Stefan Zarazan from Nicola Lapierre, Peugeot's first and second. Audi, Timo Bernhardt and Marcel Fassler and Tom Christiansen. They are third, fourth and fifth. Peugeot, Anthony Davidson, sixth after his recent excursion. The two Lola Astons, as was. Adrian Fernandez still driving ahead of Sam Hancock, 007 and 009. They're seventh and eighth. Rounding out the top ten, Christian Albers in the older Colles Audi, the R10 TDI. He's in ninth. And Sayel Iari in car number six, Uke Shonag's Orica prototype, the open car rather than the Peugeot closed car. That lies in tenth place. And we'll take a quick commercial break and round up the rest of the classes on the other side of this word. Welcome back live to Le Mans. As you see, the second car in the GT car, uh, GT2 class, uh, GT1 class even, having a uh, routine pit stop. This is the Alfa Aventura Corvette car number 73, which was driven earlier by Xavier Masson when it had an unintentional collision. Uh, I think it was that car with the number one Peugeot. Now, Julien Jus has taken it over joined Luc Alphonse's team earlier this year at the beginning of the Le Mans series program and uh, turning into quite an entertaining young sports car peddler as well. We've covered the overall top 10 just a minute or two ago and that all includes the LMP1 cars. This is the number one machine of Anthony Davidson so he was obviously pretty much due a stop when he had his incident a couple of laps ago. Didn't bother coming in because he knew he was coming in anyway. Torches as you would expect examining every Everything. Car looks okay. Anthony staying in and just receiving fuel tires there on the far side of the car as we look at it now, just in case. And that is the sign of the impact there below the P1 label with what we, uh, what I'm sure was that 73 yeah. Corvette in the GT2 class. So our leader goes out. There is Anthony Davidson sharing with Mark Genet and Alexander Wurtz. Average height of the team is about five foot eight. 
Because Except for Vert. Well, exactly, no, only because Alexander Vert is about six foot three. Yeah. And Davidson's about five foot oh. And Martin yeah. Genet is about average racing driver height as opposed to petite racing driver height, which Davidson is. And how Davidson gets in off the back of Vert without having a massive seat insert, Lord only knows. Oh, but, uh, amazing. He's out and back up to speed and again, as you have to in this race, showing ultimate commitment right from the moment he gets out of the pit lane and right back up to speed. I so feel rather sad actually that his Formula One career has not taken off again in any way because uh, if you looked at his testing times when he was with Honda, he was very, very much on the pace and I think that uh, the newer teams, the three new teams, made a serious error in not getting him because he is such a good sorter of cars. There's a big difference actually uh, that's becoming more and more prevalent uh, now in Formula One and in sports cars as well, where everything is done with the computer and you put it all in and that's fine and that's what it says. And then the driver says, no, it doesn't actually do that. Well, the problem is if you've got a new car with new designers and new engineers and a whole new program and you put in a driver who doesn't know what a good Formula One car feels like, you're never going to get the feedback that tells you when the Formula One car is good. Exactly. It's just going to be whatever it is, and he's yeah. just going to drive it as quickly as he can. If you then rent somebody who does know what good feels like, you end up getting guided in the same, in, in the correct direction. We see that time and time again in single-seater championships where midfield at best teams hire a decent driver, and then he tells them when they're in the sweet spot, and suddenly they end up winning races and being right up the sharp end the grid at elevated levels that they would never otherwise have attained and yeah it is a shame uh, for Anthony that he hasn't been picked up long before now and unfortunately a lot of the teams have missed out yeah but that is that not uh, sports sports car game to have got someone like uh, Anthony I Davidson think, I think to have him with a team like uh, Peugeot yes absolutely um, it is sports cars game and I think that that probably is going to mean that for want of a better word if you look at the fact that Alan McNeish is uh, life's begun for him this year you know um, well <laughs> Anthony is about nine years younger so life could just about begin to be beginning for him and he could actually find himself a very nice safe berth in uh, international sports car racing world championship sports car racing and I think that would be a good thing for him now because he deserves it yeah and, and actually, Antti, um, comparing him to Alan Manish, I think is a, is a probably decent uh, comparison because yeah. Alan certainly used success in sports cars to regenerate a career in single seat, or a, a career that in single seat has had sort of ground to a, a fairly uh, disappointing halt for him. He picked up a good ride in... Uh, in sports cars, ended up being a Porsche factory driver, ended up winning Le Mans, and then by dint of being one of the best sports car drivers in the business, ended up being attracted by, uh, or Toyota ended up being attracted to him and giving him a run in their Formula One car. Okay, didn't end up with him then conquering the dizzying heights of Formula One, but there's an awful lot of drivers that have been into Formula One and come out the other end and haven't got anything on their CV even ro remotely as interesting as one Le Mans win, never mind a series of Le Mans wins. So, yeah, Alan didn't end up being the Formula One world champion, but he's done something that uh, not very many people get to do either, which is become a multiple Le Mans winner. In relation to what you were saying and uh, being a member of, of a team, uh, a Formula One team, and bringing in a driver who knows what does work and what doesn't work, one of the big problems, of course, with the Toyota Formula One team was they never actually made the car work as well as it should have done. And I sometimes doubt whether they had anybody who was able to really sort it. Well, because that was because the car was uh, designed by committee from yes, Japan. Yes, yes. Uh, one of the big problems that I think everyone is well aware of, that um, some, I don't say all, but some of the Japanese tend to make or tended to make and this also was they were the Honda team at one time all the decisions in Japan by committee and it took 10 days or a fortnight to actually get someone to say yes as opposed to in Formula One it ought to take somewhere around about 10 seconds to say yes we will or no we won't but that's where Honda were clever yeah. in bringing in Ross Braun it who, was indeed yeah who could take the whole thing forward and it could have worked and would have worked for them had they had the patience to stay with it but they somehow or other I think uh, threw all their toys out of the pram and there you go third place car on pit road Timo Bernhardt in the number 
nine Audi. Three red lights down the side denotes that it's in third place in its class. The red denotes that it is in the P1 class, so the overall fastest running cars. And he hands his car over. So that car is lying two laps off the lead, one lap behind the second place Peugeot, which is not the sort of gap that you are necessarily going to find on pace alone, particularly if you're an Audi, which is slower than the Peugeot's, but with 13 hours still to go, plenty of time for people to bump into, trip over, or otherwise have problems with things not necessarily of their own making. Got a question for you two. Go ahead. You're both sage, sage chaps, and don't be around this long. How in the God in heaven did our friends at Audi come to Le Mans with a car two years running this year which wasn't competitive? How did it happen? I can't believe that the Germans would do it. Well, because Peugeot have accelerated their program and pushed their program so far forward in the way that Audi did over the years to defeat the current front runners when they arrived. And they have overtaken Audi. But and Mar it's as simple as that. Martin, I don't think, I, I really don't think that Audi is the car that it should be. No. It, well, it is exactly the car they designed. They have got what they wanted, according to the drivers. Yeah, but it's, it is turning the speed that they wanted it to turn in the simulations. What's happened is Peugeot, particularly in the engine department, has taken a big step forward ah. that nobody expected and certainly Audi didn't expect. So you think it's the engine department that has made to some degree the difference? Well, the chassis is the same as last year and the year before and the year before and the year before. The aerodynamics are barely changed and yet it's going a lot faster. Yeah, well, I think that uh, puts us all in our place. You know, I never thought of it quite it, that way. It's pretty straightforward. Peugeot introduced a new engine this year, a much quicker new engine this year, and Audi were caught napping. They really were caught napping because it was quite amazing. I mean, when we first came here on uh, Thursday, on, on Wednesday, and I came up here, and I just looked for those first few laps, uh, I stood at the back of the box there and said in a loud voice, and Mark said, Psh. I said, well, that's it, isn't it? You know? I'm, I'm sad. I'm sad to say that I was proved right. Unless something happens. But, yeah. but, but uh, Neville, going back to what you've just been talking about, but, uh, designed by committee, is, yeah. uh, are you not saying that about Audi? The thing was designed by committee, not by, you know. Well, no, no car is now designed by one single person. No. Apart, from, apart from anything, you have an engine department and a chassis department and an aerodynamic department because there are too many disciplines for Colin Chapman to sit down and draw it up on a piece of paper in a week like he used to do in the good old days. So everything is designed by a committee. That doesn't make it inefficient. It makes it efficient when people are concentrating on their specialist areas but what has happened here is Peugeot have taken a step ahead that Audi have not matched it's as simple as that it happens the other strange thing of course uh, while we're talking about design and design of racing cars sports racing cars and what have you is that there was one man who stands out a head and shoulders above everybody else who has designed Grand Prix cars in the last 20 years and that's Adrian Newey silence yes. but it is you think about it think back to the uh, days of Williams days of McLaren the current days he really has had a grip that is quite amazing over the last 20 years I would venture that Ross Braun has been in charge of more cars that have won more championships ah yes I'm not saying that I'm saying that from the pure design standpoint design doesn't always do it as, uh, uh, as no. every race is proving and again Looking here at the uh, Judd-powered car of Paul Drayson and his team, this car has been single-handedly, I think, about the most troublesome thing in the pit road. It has been in and out with a catalogue of woes that I don't think the team could possibly have envisaged in their worst nightmares. It's, uh, the car has generally been pretty reliable so far this season, but clearly was saving up an awful lot of spite for the race, what they're doing, I don't know what they're doing here now, looks like they're recompressing an air system of some kind, unless they're filling up a drink system, that took an awful long time, it's, it has been a catalogue of errors for that car, it just refuses to stay on the track, despite which, Paul Jason, Johnny Cochran and Manueli Pier are actually test, uh, turning some fairly quick laps when it's out on the track, but the number of mates, in fact, let's 
let's see how many. It's now made 14 pit stops. The next most is the WR with 13. And in the LMP1 class, oh, in fact, Neil Yarny's number 12 Rebellion Lola has made 14 stops as well. But it's the racing car they've had a lot of problems with it. And every time it comes in, they have to fix an extra something, which is why it's nowhere near the top 10. And in fact, not even anywhere near the top 20. It's 33rd place. Meanwhile, fourth place, uh, second place car number four comes in. And Nicolas Lapierre bails out at the end of his uh, triple stint in that car. That is its 14th pit stop. Same as the Drayson car. It has now completed 175 laps. The Drayson car 143 laps, and that tells its own story. Puncture there on the AF Corsa Ferrari. Now, we may well be in for a bit of a rash of GT pit stops, or uh, either that or this may be out of sequence. If he's lucky, it will have come when he was planning to come into the pits anyway. We did see that uh, Giancarlo Pisichello was helmeted up anyway, so I suspect him, despite the grim look on John Alesi's face, Pisichello was ready. I think perhaps Alesi was due to come in now anyway in the GT2 class, looking rather uh, accusingly at the tyres there, but uh, generally speaking, tyres don't puncture all on themselves. They normally have something go into them, so can't normally blame the rubber for everything. GT2 still being led by the number 64 Corvette of Olivier Beretta at the moment. 63 Corvette still in second place, even after it was beached in the gravel. Antonio Garcia took that car over. That's the GT2 lead battle. Alessi being debriefed quickly by the team. Uh, Mark Lieb third in the GT2 class, fourth is Raymond Narak, they're both in Porsche, 77 is the first of the Felbermeyer Proton cars, 76 Raymond Narak in the IMSA Matmut performance car, in fifth in the GT2 class is Horst Farmbasher, senior or junior, I'm not sure, scoring doesn't tell us, in their 89 car, the Hankook Ferrari, uh, sorry, Dominic Farmbasher that uh, he shares with Alan Simonson and Lee Keane, and finally, sixth in the class is the BMW, the 78 car, the white BMW. Augusto Farf is currently at the wheel of the car. He shares with Jörg Muller and Uwe Altsen. And that's starting to shake off its problems and make some progress up the order now after the sixth place ahead of Richard Westbrook in the 97 BMS Scuderia Italia Porsche. We'll be back with more from Le Mans in just a 